for the um, Droid Cafe. So this is kind of where we're we're working into is is that with a few different fields and a different a few different kinds of inputs. Um, and I do want to add in a spinner there. They don't have that on the lab, but um, spinners are kind of a really important thing to understand how to work with in Android. Yeah, I got a quick question on the mm -hmm. spinners. Yep. Is that that's just that's a horrible name for what those are, isn't it? A drop down and those things like an obo that that spin around to let the user know. That was an obo, hey, by the way. That was Bootstrap, is what you're thinking about. So oh, okay, whatever the rotating circle. You yeah. Know, what, what is that called then? So that is called a spinner. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> so, so you have to kind of understand. There's some history here. Um, so, remember, walk back to you know roughly 2010 and and around that kind of point. Um, Apple was remember the first one to the smartphone market, right? So they they were the first ones to well the touchscreen market with their first iPhone. Um, so they kind of got in there first and, and got to set a lot of the expectations for users um, that Android then kind of copied a lot of those things. So um, one of the things that happened, you know, if you think about desktop apps, um, we think, you know, hey, drop downs is a common thing you have, right? It, any website, any app is pretty much going to have a drop down somewhere, right? So. Yeah. A drop down sort of a collapsible list of, of options. Um, as it turns out, um, they're actually one of those controls that doesn't translate well to touch screens. They don't translate well to touch screens. And part of that is they just take up too much darn space on the screen. On, on a little bitty four inch screen, uh, a, 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 a drop down takes up too much space. Um, so what, what iPhone did is they said, okay, we will take a different approach to how we deal with drop downs. Everybody with me so far? You. Yep. So what they did instead, instead of implementing quote unquote drop downs as drop downs, what you would do is you'd tap on the control, it would actually kind of pop up a window um, pop a little dialog box and it would look like a spinning wheel and so you would spin through the options and it actually was was circular um, so you could spin up or you could spin down and you typically would see you know the option you had selected and kind of would be highlighted uh, um, focused on but you could also see like the option above or below and and so it kind of looked like a wheel so you could spin that wheel to get to the correct option Okay. So that's like slot machine. Yeah, actually very much. It looked almost exactly like a slot machine. Um, so that's what the iPhone did with drop downs. And so when Android came onto the market, they had the same problem that drop downs don't work well on small touchscreens. So they took that approach to make their drop downs work the same way, where it looked more like a slot machine. That's where the name spinner comes from. Oh, okay. That's where that comes from. And so um, that dates back, you know, basically going back 10 years. Um, when you're talking about the um, that spinny thing of something's working, and let me pull that up so everybody kind of knows what we're talking about here. Um you know, so so before that, we kind of you know traditionally would call these things, you know, you would call those controls, we'd call those drop downs, combo boxes was the traditional name for those. Um, yes, so here's a spinner, spinner on Bootstrap. Recognize though that Bootstrap is a newer technology than Android. Okay, right? Android and iPhone is about ten years old. Um, so what's happened over the years is you know. Things have also changed in terms of just other parts of naming conventions and things like that. So um, this thing that they've called a spinner um, is really, you know, a different form of a progress bar, right? So traditionally a progress bar um, would go from left to right and kind of would show you like this how far along you are. Does that make sense? 
Um, and so this was kind of the traditional way we'd used to measure progress. Um, as it turns out, with a lot of things, especially in modern technology and dealing with web services and the online world, you don't know how long something's going to take most of the time today. Um, it's very rare that you know that it, the process is, say, 30 or 40 percent done. Most of the time you just know that something's happening, please wait. Um, so that's where, you know, this would be one way to kind of measure progress and tell the user that, that something's working. Um, the spinner is another way to tell the user that something is happening, please wait, right? And so back in the day, you know, rewinding several years, you know, what you used to see in Windows when this kind of thing happened would be the hourglass. If Does anybody remember seeing hourglass in Windows? Yeah. Your cursor would just kind of constantly be turning, you know, drop the top, drop the sand, spin, drop the sand, spin. So this is kind of, you know, this this sort of UI is kind of what's replaced the hourglass, if that makes sense. Um, so, yes, this is called a spinner. Um, I would really think about this more as a you know, a progress bar or a an hourglass, it's kind of has that same purpose versus a spinner or an Android is a is a combo box. That's what it is. Um, but the the problem is because it, you know, in reality, not a spinner was maybe not a good name for either of those two things. If that makes sense. But yeah, there's some there's some naming conflict there. Um, as far as that goes. So when we're talking about spinners in the space of Android, we're not talking about the same spinners as Bootstrap. We're talking about spinners that um, let you pick from a set of options. Okay. Um, one thing I want to point out as we kind of go through here, there are a number of things that are on the reading material um, that are not on the slides, as it turns out. And in fact, um, the, the main things I want to talk about and point out today um, are actually not on the slides. Um, they're in the reading material, but they are not on the slides. So um, my plan for today is kind of to go through the, the chapter here and we'll kind of skim through um, rather than going to the slides because, hey, that information is not, just not there. Okay. So if you see me going through the book today, that's that's why is because I want to touch on some stuff here. Um, now, I will say, you know, the, the big thing that we're going to talk about is some of these new UI controls and, and some other things in, to think about in terms of UI, such as thinking about the soft keyboard. Um, there is a lot of information in this chapter that you probably honestly already know. You know, you've built apps for desktop, you've built apps for website. Um, you probably know a lot of this information already, okay? So um, I'm, I am going to skim over most of it and just focus on those things that are new, if that makes sense. Yep. Um, okay. So to kind of jump into it, you know, there's a lot of different UI controls in Android, um, but the few that the, we want to focus on for this chapter are kind of shown here. Um, now let me get my zoom up a little bit. Um, so all of these are, you know, they're a way to give input into your program. So we call them input controls. Um, so you've got your, your edit text, which we've already seen, you know, you're basically your text fields. You've got um, seat bars, um, where you can kind of move that thumb left and right and pick a value between a range. Um, Mind you, this is for picking inexact values. You know, you don't want to use this if I want to pick um, an exact number, then then it's better to have this as a as a text box if you want the user to have an exact number. But to get a rough rough idea, oftentimes for volumes where you don't things or things like that where you don't care about the exact value, exact number, then then those are great. Um, so so those do come up. We honestly will not do too much with seek bars in the course um, because a lot of things that we're building really don't, I'd rather have exact values for rather than sort of course values for, if that makes sense. 
So I don't. I don't want to feel like we're like I'm taking this off topic, but yeah. is there a way to set the increments on number two to be like increments of like five or ten, or does it, is it just a, a? Um, I would have to go back and look. I think they do. Um, most most frameworks now do. I do think there what there is what you call a step value. Okay. Um, I do believe that that exists. Um, and, and so sometimes, yeah, that, that may be something that you do sometimes. Um, I have, you know, in, in as far as the industry concern, is concerned, um, I have in the past actually made a custom subclass of the seek bar um, because, you know, sometimes you need to see like dashes, like major lines and minor lines of, of where that is. Um, but yeah, if I remember right there, you can set a minimum value, a max value and a step. I think it does support all of those. Um, at least in 5.0 and higher. Um, okay. I think I'll, in, um... if I remember right, going back to Android 4.0, I don't think it supported the step. Okay. I just didn't want to so, take it far. I'll, um, I'll write that yeah. down and check into it later yeah. in my own time. So if, if you have an application that, you know, that really where that makes sense, we can talk about it more. Um, but, but realistically, most of the programs that we build this semester, this is just not going to make a lot of sense for that. Um, okay. So um, next up would be checkboxes. Checkboxes work the same as you're used to. You know, it's a either on and or off, and you they're all independent. Um, next would be radio buttons. Again, circles. They use that same um, design methodology that as you know, squares or checkboxes, circulars, are radio buttons. So you can pick one radio button from a from a group, um, but you can't pick more than one. Um, it's worth noting that if you're going to use radio buttons, you actually do need to use two components. Um, you need to use a radio button, which is an individual choice, uh, but you also need to use a radio group. And radio group is actually a subclass of linear layout. Um, so it can be either a horizontal group or it can be a vertical group. Um, but radio group is what says, you know, these things go together. You can only pick one from this set of options. Um, so you're always going to see those two things together. You're never going to see a radio button without a radio group. Um, next up would be switches. And this is, you know, right and colored is on, left and left and um, left and grayed out is, is basically off. So this is an on off switch. Um, in reality, um, as far as the code's concerned, these two things work the same. A switch and a checkbox are the same from the code standpoint. Um, so the only difference is that they look different. It's the only difference between those two. They look different, but they behave the same. Um, so whether you use a checkbox or whether you use a switch is really a matter of subjectivity. Um, Sometimes you know uh, a checkbox is more clear about what you're what you're trying to do or what you're trying to enable or disable, and sometimes a switch is clearer about what that option does. Um, so it's just a matter of, of figuring out for that specific case which of those two make more sense. Okay. Um, generally speaking, one of the recommendations though is that if you're going to have checkboxes, they kind of appear together in groups. Um, whereas um, switches tend to be more independent. Um, so they're, they're not related to each other and oftentimes not next to each other. Um, and then finally, as we were kind of talking about, you've got your spinner. Um, so your spinner is, is the Android version of a combo box where you, know, you start with a text box or it looks like a text box with a drop down. You can either type in a value or you can click the, or you can press the drop down to pick from a set of predefined values. Um, so that's that's kind of the space of a spinner is. Now, one of the reasons we need to talk about spinner um, is because it's the first one that we'll see uh, of something called an adapter view, um, which is what you need to use anytime you want to display a list of things. Um, so there are three kind of basic adapter view sort of things or, or things that are similar to that. Um, one of those is spinner. Spinner lets you pick from a set of options. Another one is list view. Um, and list view and spinner are very, very similar. The difference between the list view, all the options are always visible. 
Um, so you can pick an option there um, versus the, the spinner, they're only visible as you're selecting one. Um, another thing there, spinner, you can only pick one option. List view, you can potentially pick multiple. Um, the third one that fits into that picture, it's not actually an adapter view, um, but it's based on the, the kind of ideas of list view and learning some things from that is the actual recycler view, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. So recycler view, and, which, is, which is absolutely vital anytime you want to display a list of things, um, pretty much any app you write for Android will have a recycler view at some point. Recycler view and adapter views have a lot in common. So some of the things that we kind of get practice with um, using these, these spinners will also translate over to, okay, I can kind of understand how this, this recycler view works, okay? So they're not exactly the same, but there's, there's a lot of commonality there where I wanna make sure that we have some time to talk about that. Okay, so as far as this chapter goes, you know, the, the two big areas that I'd say that most students have trouble um, or, or difficulty is A, first of all, with the spinners, and actually second of all, with the edit texts. Um, because when you're dealing with edit text, one of the things you have to deal with is the keyboard. And dealing with keyboards on Android is a non-trivial thing. Uh, the biggest thing there is that, you know, there's a lot of different inputs, um, whether it be physical inputs um, or the soft keyboard. The soft keyboard is a is a thing that a lot of people, until they've done Android or mobile development, they don't really think about you know the, the soft keyboard and how to make that work well and how to deal with the fact that it oftentimes covers anywhere from a third of your screen to half of your screen, uh, which means that you really have to design your UIs around that fact because you're, you're losing a sizable amount of your space um, for the keyboard, which, which also appears and disappears. Um, so, you know, you've got to really think about that. So those are the kind of two areas of, of focus for today is spinners and, and edit text. Okay. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay. So talking about um, things that are available there, you know, in general, if you're talking about making choices um, where you've got a predefined set of things where it's like either it's choice A, B, C, or D, or yes or no, you know, check boxes, radio buttons, toggle buttons, switches, spinners. Those are basically ways to choose from a pre-selected option. Um, on the, the flip side, if you don't know, if you don't know ahead of time what the user is going to pick or what the list of possible options are for instance you know names basically it's edit text you know all of these other controls are strictly for places where you know there's only a certain number of things that the user can pick um, where you can constrain that that input set um, but if you can't constrain it then edit text is your answer um, okay so input controls and view focus. Um, so in Android, there is an idea of focus, just like you're kind of familiar with in the world of desktop and Windows and such. Um, but focus on Android does not work actually the same way as it does um, on Windows. Um, so you know, let's think about you know what you know about say say web development what can you tell me about what you already know about focus and how it works in the the web world i think of tab tabbing okay. into something or you can click into it okay but either one that that gains focus if they're okay. if it's in the tab order okay all right what else What else would gain focus, you mean? Well, what else about focus? You would need it to interact with whatever control that is. Okay. Um, important question. How many things can have focus? One. Only one. Okay. Is it possible for nothing to have focus? No. It actually is. That That's one common oversight. Um, it's possible... It, all, it's always possible for nothing to have focus. That is a possibility. Um, 
And so the most common case where that happens is if the user is using another application um, where that applic other application has focus. Um, but, but it is still possible in Windows for nothing to have focus. Um, that is actually a possibility. Um, it, it is something you have to code around. Um, so your, your focus may be completely outside of your app or it just may be that nothing in Windows is focused. But at most, it can be one thing. Um, at most, it can be one thing. So that, that, that kind of understanding does translate over to Android, that at most one thing can have focus, but it's also possible that nothing has focus. Um, you mentioned that tab can be used to, to cycle through things. What can I use, what, what do I press on, on Windows if I want to cycle in reverse order through things? Shift tab. Shift tab, okay. So I can do tab to go forwards and shift tab to go backwards, right? Is that my only way to change focus? Is through the keyboard. You could click on things. Okay, I could click on things. All right, any other options? What if my laptop has a touch screen? You can press tapping. Tap. Yeah, so I might tap on the screen and that would also change focus, right? So you've got the mouse that can change focus by clicking on things. You've got um, touch screens that can change focus by tapping on things. And you've got um, the, the keyboard which can um, change focus by by doing um, tab or shift tab. Uh, some applications also support other input mechanisms such as some sometimes you can use the arrow keys to move up down left and right through your UIs um, so that's also a possibility um, that kind of figures into quote-unquote focus. Um, so, so those are all kind of things to, to think about. Now, if you're looking at your modern uh, modern Android device, okay, you have all those options in Windows. What options do you have on most modern modern Android devices in terms of changing focus? Just tapping. Just tapping. Is that the only one? Well, you could hook up a keyboard to it and then mm -hmm. tab through it, I suppose. Okay. That doesn't so happen as often, like on a Chromebook, maybe. Mm -hmm. I could hook up a Bluetooth keyboard. What else? There's there's one other there's on one other way to change focus on Android. The that's still pretty common. It's not by how hard you uh, hold the screen, is it? Like a no. Oh, I think that's only on Apple. So if you've paid close attention to the soft keyboard, um, you'll notice that oftentimes there's a button that pops up on there called Next. So oftentimes the keyboard will have a Next key. Does that make sense? Which would take you to the next thing that has fo the next, put focus on the next thing, okay? So those are the kind of the, the main ways that you're gonna see focus. Honestly, tapping and next on the keyboard are the two primary ways that you're gonna see focus nowadays. Okay, everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, there are some, some nuances more beyond that. Um, and so, um, there's actually two kinds of one of the things that we'll get we need to get in here there's actually two kinds of quote unquote focusable in android and um, keyboard focus is actually treated different than touch focus um, those are there's some a little bit of there's some little bit of nuance between how those behave and those often behave differently um, so if we're thinking about um, the, the different flags that 
can be applied to a control in Android, um, there are three kind of ones that, that generally apply. So first of all, all is there's the, the focusable is you can say, is this widget, is this view focusable or not focusable? And, and every view can be marked focusable or not focusable. On, um, on the same note, every view can be marked either clickable or not clickable. Um, uh, so those are those are options. So if it's if it's clickable, then it will fire the on click event. Um, if it's not clickable, it will never fire the on click event. Um, uh, if it's focusable, then that means it can receive focus through all those variety of, of ways of changing focus. Um, on the flip side, there's also something that's known as as focusable in touch mode. Um, and so there's, those are actually two different flags. So something may be focusable with the keyboard, but not focusable by tapping on it. Um, so one of, those, one of those things in Android is that if I tap on a button, uh, buttons are focusable, but they're not focusable in touch mode. Okay. So if I tap on a button, that button does not actually get focus, which is what normally would happen in Windows. If I click on a button, that button gets focus. That doesn't happen in Android. Um, on the contrary, if I were to say hook up a, a keyboard and tab to that button, that button would get focus by tabbing to it, but not by tapping on it. Does that make sense? Because buttons are focusable, but they're not focusable in touch mode. Um, so that means that um, your focus as you're tapping around um, doesn't change as as maybe you would expect it with either a web or a desktop API. Um, it generally only generally the only things that end up receiving focus by tapping on them are edit text and most other things if you want to put focus on them you actually would need a keyboard. Okay. Um, and that's actually whether it be a soft keyboard or a physical keyboard. Um, so there's a few things you need to know as far as devices and input methods that are available. Um, you've kind of already seen the soft keyboard, which pops up on your device. Um, that's one of the more commonly used ones. Um, but Android, devi Android devices can actually have a lot of other things. Um, so for instance, if I, you know, look at some of the devices that were available years ago, right? So this is looking at an Android device from, from 2009. You'll see that this device has a lot of buttons on it, right? So if we, if we kind of look at what's here, we've got on the front, we've got a home button. We've got your task list button. We've got your back button, right? So you see those, right? Um, also on here, you'll notice that there's a, first of all, there's a full QWERTY keyboard. In fact, that QWERTY keyboard has Alt and Shift keys, which is completely un unheard of today. Um, but there's there's a physical, there's a keyboard that, that pulls out. Um, there's also this, this deal here, um, which is a combination of a few things. You can see there's an up, down, up, up, left, right, down. You see that? Yeah. That's what we refer to as a D-pad or a directional pad. Um, so you can kind of use it like you would the arrow keys on a on a full size keyboard. Um, so you can actually use that to navigate around Android devices. And most devices, you know, nowadays don't have these things, um, but some devices still do. And and occasionally you may need to integrate support for those kind of things. Um, the other thing that you'll see inside inside of here, this little circle. Um, is actually two things. Um, you can either press it, some of those you could press, and it would function basically as an enter key, or it actually, a lot of the times, and I think in this case, this is actually a little joystick um, that you can use to move around the screen. Um, so it, it, in some cases, that actually functioned as a mouse cursor, that little joystick. Um, in some, some uh, laptops, you'll kind of see that's, that, that thing as well. Um, so, you know, those are actually other input methods that you might see on Android devices. Um, so you can't have keyboards, you can't have those, you can have those connected to um, Android. 
Um, if I look at some other devices here, so this is the um, HTC Hero. Again, this is around 2009 when this device came out. If I kind of look at what's on there, um, I can see there's a lot of physical controls. So this this little thing here, does anybody know what that that circle circular thing is? That's a D-pad. It's not a D-pad. Doesn't it like roll and you can use it to select? It does things? roll. Yep. It's actually a little ball. Is that like the scroller? It's a sort of. It's a. It's, oh. This is Blackberry's had those things. This is a little trackball. So so there are some. There were some Android devices that actually had little trackballs built into them, and so you could use this to move around the screen like a little cursor. You know, this is their use. You know. It, we used to have mice that we use with our computer that we kind of we'd move around that way, um, and and it used to be that that you know you had these kind of balls on the bottom of your mouse before we got laser mice, um, so that was a way to kind of navigate around the screen. Um, so it's called a trackball. Um, you've got a menu button. You've got a a search button. You've got your back button. You've got your home button. You even got like a call button and a, a hang up button. This is from back when phones were used to actually call people. Um, so they had physical buttons to do things like that. Um, so, you know, those devices, these are much less common, um, but you, depending on what you're targeting, um, you may need to still think about those, those physical buttons. Um, and there are ways in the emulator to enable all this stuff, so you can emulate all that, all these things, um, in the emulator. Should you need to deal with older devices, um, you know, you've also got, as we kind of mentioned, Bluetooth keyboards. Um, you've got a lot of those are actually on the market, and so something like this, I can plug into. Um, I can actually plug this in. I can connect this to my Android device and use it to navigate around the device kind of like I would a computer. Um, so those those input mechanisms do exist. Um, but if we kind of wind towards, you know, more modern devices, you know, here's here's what devices kind of Android devices look like today, right? Um, whereas back, you know, 10 years ago, we used to have a lot of buttons um, on our devices. Um, we actually typically, uh, modern devices don't actually have any buttons on the front, right? So you can see that you got a little camera here that's that's poking through the screen um, and takes a little bit of your screen space, but there's no, there's no physical buttons on the front, kind of thanks to pushes from Apple and, you know, other, you know, Samsung and, and other market leaders. We've, we've got most of our Android devices don't have don't have buttons. Um, so, so you know, that's the kind of world you have to think about. So, most of our most of the stuff that we do now is is with software buttons, not with physical buttons. Okay, physical buttons still still exist, but most of our buttons are written are in software now. Um, so, one of the things that means is. Um, as you're working with software buttons, well, software buttons aren't necessarily always there um, on the screen, and they may change how they behave. Um, so in reality, as you're working with software buttons, um, you really do have to think about that as you're building your app and designing it, and think about the space that they're gonna take up, the, the functionality that they're gonna have, um, those are things that you maybe have to think about more now than you than you would have had to um, previously. Or, or things like, hey, there's a camera that's covering part of the screen. I got to make sure that I don't put anything there um, that would be covered. Um, or a lot of devices have a notch that's here in the middle and covers covers part of that screen. So you got to kind of design around those UI specifications. Um, or, you know, when we're designing for older devices like this, you know, you got to think about those physical buttons. You don't have to think about, is that button going to cover the screen? But you have to make sure that those buttons work. You have to make sure that you put in um, event handlers for those buttons oftentimes. Because um, a lot of times these buttons didn't necessarily work out of the box. They required a little bit of coding um, to make sure that they behaved properly. Okay. So 
do kind of keep that full spectrum in, in, in mind as you're working through and thinking about Android devices. Um, things like this aren't really all that common in, in most consumers, um, but uh, the places that things like this still appear um, are actually not so much in the, like you probably won't have one of these in your pocket, um, but um, it's very likely somebody who's using the tablet might have like a USB keyboard. And that means that you have to think about all of those same kind of things. Um, so you, you still have to think about that. Another thing that's common is in terms of accessibility. Um, you know, trackballs and, and directional pads and things like that may seem kind of an odd thing nowadays, um, but a lot of people who have, um, people who have disabilities, physical disabilities, still use a lot of things or rely on these functionalities, whether it be D-pads or trackballs or stuff, um, because, you know, their, their physical disability prevents them from using some of the traditional input mechanisms, okay? So um, in, in terms of accessibility, you do got to think a little bit broader than maybe what you are just familiar with. Okay. Hey, Mr. Smith, quick question. On yep. my keyboard app, I use SwiftKey, and yep. there's an option there where you can enable these directional arrows. Does that work okay. like a D-pad, like, like yeah, we see with the Motorola? Yeah, it would okay. be the, the directional pad is, is kind of the same, the same idea. Okay. Yeah, they don't work that great. They, I tap them accidentally all the time. Not yeah. the best UX, but it's it's possible to do that. It's possible to do that, and you know, um, you, there are some cases where they may be, you know, they may be a helpful thing. You know, if you were thinking about putting a spreadsheet app sort of thing, working with spreadsheets on a phone, well, then a, a directional pad is a very helpful thing to work with a spreadsheet. Um, but most of the time that's not what we're doing um so 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 keep that kind of that scope in mind of you know there's there's a lot of different input mechanisms that exist out there okay so you know as they mentioned here most most of the most of our android devices are navigated by touch um, but there are some Android devices. Um, there may be some devices that are not navigated primarily by touchscreen, but might be navigated through other means, such as your your directional pad, trackball, etc., a mouse or or things like that. Um, so um, out of the box, um, Android kind of figures out how to change focus as you go through controls, specifically. You know, whether you're doing tab or you're pressing next on the software keyboard, it kind of figures it out usually. Um, and the way it figures out, it kind of moves from left to right and top to bottom. Um, so as long as you've got your controls kind of logically arranged, uh, most of the time there's not a whole lot you have to do with focus. Um, you may have to do things like um, if the user enters something incorrectly, you may need to put focus on the, the place where there's an error. Um, if the user submits a form, you may need to move focus all the way up to the top control. Um, or you might need to hide the keyboard or things like that. Um, so a lot of times you don't need to specifically tell it which is the next thing that it can focus. Um, but, sometime, you know, but sometimes you may need to adjust things a little bit. Um, okay. So there's a lot there about kind of the, the D-pad and the trackball. Um, in the XML, should you find that your um, focus is not changing correctly? Um, and usually the right answer, if it's not changing correctly, is to just kind of reorganize your UI so that it can just automatically figure it out. Because, um, you know, honestly, if, if you have a UI that, that Android can't automatically figure out what's the next focus, it's probably also going to be confusing to your users. Um, so usually the right answer is to arrange it in such a way that Android can just automatically figure it out. Um, in cases where that's not an option, um, there are some attributes that you can set in the XML, namely um, next focus down, next focus left, right, and up, and you can tell it the ID 
of where it should go from that particular control. So if I know that I want to go from, say, uh, the rectangle thing, I want to go from the width to the height, um, I can put on the width control, I can say next focus, next focus right, will go to the, go to the height control. Um, so if I needed to customize that, I can. Um, and you do that through the XML. Um, so here would be an, an example. They have put this in a linear layout. And so they've said um, they've got one button here, another button here. And so they said next focus up. So if you go up, it goes down to bottom. If you go down, it goes up to top. So it just cycles between those two. Um, in reality, that may, you know, so that may be something you need to do if you have a weird UI. Um, but most of the times you can get away, especially in this situation, by not setting either of those two things. And that will usually be more natural to your users, um, where it would just go up and down, would go between them, and then they could get out and get to um, other things. Um, following this particular scheme that they've got right here, this right immediately, I will tell you, is an accessibility problem for, um, if you were to site set it up, this would, would be accessibility for anybody that's using a keyboard because that means they can't get away from these two buttons. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, um, uh, this only works in linear layout. So if we got a scroll view no, and a constraint it, it, layout, the, the these okay. four these four properties work in any layout. It doesn't matter what the layout is. It works in any layout. Okay, I'm just catching that first paragraph, the first sentence of that first paragraph. It's mm -hmm. may lead you down that path of thinking it's only yeah. working. No, the the next focus down, next focus up, left and right. Those work in absolutely any layout. Um, it does not need to be a a linear layout. Uh, it, but I will say in linear layout, you basically never need to do this, ever. Um, because linear layouts already, if, you, if it's in a linear layout, it already knows how to go through it. Um, it's, this is more comes up if you're using something like a relative layout. Um, relative layout, it was very, it's a very, it's, it's much harder for it to figure out what the next thing is. Um, okay. So yada yada, I kind of mentioned, you know, there's two properties, Android focusable and Android focusable in touch mode. Um, so if you do need to change something that um, maybe isn't normally focusable, then you might need to change one or both of those properties. Um, or if you're making a, a custom control of some sort, then you may need to mess with those. Um, most of the times I will say though, um, you usually don't need to set focusable or focusable in touch mode um, because usually you want whatever the default behavior is for that control. Um, not always the case, but but most of the times the, the default behavior is the desired behavior. Um, if you do want to specifically handle changes to the focus, um, you can hook up listeners to that. Um, so for instance, if you want to um, get an event, get called back when the focus changes. You can hook up a, a listener, which will get, which will get the on focus change event, um, and find out what view currently has focus. You can call on the activity. You can say get current focus. That will tell you what, what control currently has, what view currently has focus. Um, if you're on a view group, you can say get focus child. So, and that will tell you if there is something inside of that, inside of that view group, whether it be a linear layout, constraint layout, scroll view, anything of that sort, um, radio button group, um, those, that will tell you if there is something focused in there and, and what is it. Um, Find focus is one thing in there. If you want to change where the focus is, um, then you call request focus. So that'll ask for the Android operating system to change it from wherever focus is to give your specific control focus. Um, um, and then kind of as was mentioned, you can implement the set, the focus change listener. 
and set that on a queue. Um, that will give you two events. It will give you an event for when it gains focus. You can also get an event for when it loses focus um, using that change listener. So you may fire a few things um, based on that, um, such as automatically doing validation or, or things like that. Um, checkboxes, pretty easy to set up. Um, each checkbox is just going to be a, a checkbox tag. That's really all you need to know there is that it's a checkbox tag. Um, and typically, if you're going to have things like a, a checkbox radio button, a lot of these go together with like a, a submit, um, some sort of submit button, um, which is just a, a regular button. Um, if you need to find out whether or not a box is checked, um, a checkbox, this, this is actually the same method for, um, for checkboxes, radio buttons, and for switches. You can call is checked, and that will tell you if it's on or off. True or false. Okay. Um, it's worth noting that you may have to cast it down to the particular thing. So, for instance, if you want to... Um, know that it's checked or not checked, you may end up having to cast it from a view down to checkbox. Um, you, you do want to avoid casts like this wherever possible because this can actually throw an exception, um, but, but that is one way to deal with it. Um, I'm not really going to focus on the code here. I will just say that this is, this is not the right way to do things. Um, uh, this code example here is not very good. Um, so we'll get into a better example of, of how to do that when we get to the actual practical. Um, so here we've got radio buttons, kind of similar to how you set up the, the checkboxes. You're going to have a few different radio buttons um, with the them being inside of the radio group. Um, now, if I remember right, the radio buttons have the label built in. Uh, you don't need to add a separate text view to um, get that label. Um, you just set it as the, the text property on the radio button control. Okay, so you don't have to create a, a separate a separate control for the label. Um, and I believe checkboxes and checkboxes are the same way. Um, so one of the events you can handle here, you can handle the on click event on a radio button. Um, and so you can kind of use that just like you would a button. Um, Oftentimes, if you're handling the on-click event with radio buttons, we'll, we'll generally hook the same listener to them. So here you can see this first radio button. They're, they're hooking on radio button clicked, on radio button clicked, on radio button clicked. So we oftentimes will use the same handler for all of the radio buttons in the group. Everybody with me so far? You. Yep. Um, I would say, however, um, this is you. This is one way to handle um, the radio buttons. Um, you can handle the on-click event. I oftentimes find it easier or better to handle an event on the radio group, um, which tells you when when the selection changes. Um, so oftentimes, I put my handlers not to these on-click events. I might put it to the radio group and listen for the specific event there. Um, the other way to handle this is um, oftentimes you don't even need a handler for the change, the selection change, or the click event. Oftentimes the the best way to do it is just say, well, we'll we'll wait until they hit save, and at that point we'll do the logic. Um, so the only reason that you need to hook up either an on click event or hook up a, um, an event to the radio group itself um, is if you need to do something immediately when they, when they tap on the, the option, okay? So I generally prefer and say that do it when they, when they try to save the form effectively. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll do with the order screen is we'll kind of wait till the, the save button. Uh, but we can kind of look at what what happens there and how we would deal that. Um, so there's a few different ways you can implement that check. Um, oftentimes, what ends up getting done um, is if we're sharing a if we're listening to that click button, we're probably sharing that same event. 
Um, in here you get the view that they clicked on. So this is this input is just like with any on-click event. That's the view they clicked on. Here they're casting it to a radio button because they know it's a rate. It, they know this can only be called from a radio button um, and seeing there it, whether or not it's checked. Um, and then finally going through um, the uh, going through and looking at the ID and saying, well, if it's this, if it's this radio button, then do this. If it's this radio button, then do this. If it's this radio button, then do something else. So that's kind of a, a oftentimes if you do need to do something immediately, um, that may be one way to structure your code. Um, it's worth noting that if I remember right, this on click event actually gets fired before the status changed. Um, so for instance, if I click on same day shipping, um, that's changing the focus that's changing the the check state of this so if it's not already checked this checked is actually going to be false okay so this this click event happens before the the before it actually changes not after it changes which is a common point of confusion okay um, so there's that all right, so now looking at spinners. Um, so spinners, as we kind of mentioned, is a way to implement a dropdown. Um, these do look different depending on what version of Android or what the screen size is. Um, on larger larger screens, specifically tablets and, and newer devices, oftentimes it may look like this, where it actually drops down and looks like a dropdown. On a lot of older devices, it looks like um, it looks like it did on. Um, Apple where it's kind of a casino where um, what do we say um, the sort slot of, machine it's like a slot machine so it, it may appear different ways depending on the device that the user is using and I think if we look at this on API 21 I think we're gonna see a different behavior than we do on API 30 if I remember right um, because of because of that um, so when you're putting a spinner control in, um, one of the things to know about the spinner is a lot of the configuration for spinners is not done through the designer. Um, unlike almost every control, the spinner, a lot of the work has to be done in code and is not done in the designer. Okay? Um, that's one of the things that's, that's quite a bit different than some of the other controls. Um, so in order to put a spinner in, you know, step one is you just add it into your UI. If you just add a spinner into the UI, actually it, it won't work um, because there's some still some configuration that you have to use because you have to say well, what options should be there and what should happen when one of those options is selected. Um, so in order to actually get the values in there, uh, we have to use something, we typically use something called an array adapter. And an array adapter, what it does is it takes an array of items and turns it in to the actual UI controls that the user sees. So it, it does a translation between the, the data and the UI. Okay, And there's a few different ways to do that. There's a lot of customization that you can build. Oftentimes when I'm using spinners, I end up creating a custom subclass of array adapter um, so that I can just give it the, the particular data or the list of things that I have um, for my particular needs. Um, so um, one way that you can set that up is, so if, if you want to say show a list of transactions or an array of transactions or array of people, um, in order to do that you have to create an, a subclass of array adapter if you just want to display a list of strings, um, there's actually a way in Android to say, um, I want to define a string array in XML um, and then use that string array resource um, to build the adapter. So there's, there's different ways to do it depending on what your needs are. Um, but you need an array adapter. Um, in that array adapter, that array adapter also requires a layout um, for each of the items that you want to show. Um, and you can either use um, a, a layout that's already provided that's integrated, or you can use your own custom layout for the items in the spinner. Um, both of those are options. Um, if you need to handle 
when an item is selected, um, then we use the adapter view on item selected listener interface. Um, so we'll implement that. Um, unlike the on click event, but you can set up and um, define completely in XML. This is a listener you do actually have to write in code. Um, there's no way to implement the say on item selected whatever just by writing it in the XML. Okay. Um, so this is this is an area once we're working with spinners where you may have to uh, where you typically end up um, putting the the handler and writing your listeners in code. Um, we haven't done too much of that already, but we'll get into that today. Um, okay, so so looking at kind of this this look here. So we've got the the array adapter and kind of that array adapter. You start with a you start with an array of things. Um, oftentimes, just an array of strings, um, and that will take the that array, each of those items, turn it into UI controls, typically text views, but it could be something else more complicated. So that's the that's the job of the array adapter. It's to take your array of things and turn it into an array of, of views instead. Okay? So it's translating between those two. Um, if you're going to define an array in code, which commonly we do because we need to have it user visible and we also want it eventually translated. Um, you could define in your strings XML, you can define something like this. Um, previously what we've seen is, is a string tag. Here we've got a string array um, with the name labels array. Um, so here they've got a few different items in there, home, work, mobile, other. Um, so they're using that in this case and we'll kind of look at how to set that up. Um, so that's one way to back your array adapters. You can either back it with a resource or you can back it with data that you've made in code. Um, as far as implementing the on item sele selected listener, um, there's a few different ways to do that. Basically, you need to implement that interface. Um, one way that you can do that as they as they've done is you can make the class implement that, they, they made the activity class implement that interface. I would say this is usually not the way you want to do it, and I'll go kind of through the, the way that I would say is usually better. Um, this way works fine if you only have one drop down on the screen. As soon as you go to more than one, this really is not very convenient. So um, that's where I usually pick um, a different route to implement and, and hook up the listener than to have the class implement it. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of look at that using anonymous classes. Um, so there's a few different callback methods that are called that you have to implement. Um, one of them is on item selected and that's that calls that's get called when something gets selected in the in the drop down in the spinner um, or there's also on nothing selected which again gets which kind of gets called when when nothing becomes selected which is usually where things start. Um, initially nothing is selected usually. Okay. Um, there is a little bit of generics that happens because, and we'll have to deal with here because the um, adapter view is actually a generic component. Um, so you can have an adapter view that's an adapter of strings, or it can be of uh, people, or transactions, or um, whatever else type you want to be. But you have to type that adapter view specifically to the the array or the list of things that you want to show. Okay. Um, so typically we'll hook up that listener here as you can kind of see we get the spinner we hook up the listener um, using set item selected listener we'll, we'll hook that up in the on create so that's where we're going to put a lot of that code and you know kind of see where we're on create starts getting bigger um, so that's how we set that up um, we'll kind of come back to that but this is this is the way that you can create an array adapter so you use array adapter dot create from resource if you're using a um, string array resource um, there's other ways to do this if you're if you're creating a custom adapter um, but that is kind of the the most common one that we we see if we're just using a string array um, there's also set drop down view resource you can use that to change um, 
the specific layout here. They're providing a, a layout that's baked into Android um, for how those items appear. Um, so the, the basic process to get things connected is oftentimes you first have to create an adapter um, and then you have to maybe call set drop down view resource and then you call set adapter. So set adapter is what actually kind of changes the list of things that are in the spinner. Okay. So there's not a way to directly give the spinner, here's a list of strings, tell it to show that list of strings like you might be familiar with with other UI frameworks. Um, you actually have to take that, that array or that list, wrap it up in an adapter, and then provide the adapter to the spinner. Okay. So oftentimes that's, thing, that's one of the pieces that people forget, that students forget, is, is to set up the adapter or to call um, set adapter um, once they've created the adapter. Okay, so I'm going to skip by that. We'll kind of come back to this at a later point. Um, yeah, um, the method the method here that it says for, you know, if you're, if you're responding to when an item is selected, um, it takes three things. So the first thing is the um, specific view, in this case the, the uh, spinner. There's another view here. This view represents the item that the user tapped on in the in the drop down um, and then there's two integers here um, and they kind of they name them i and l um, realistically here's what they are position and id um, so you get actually the position where it is in the drop down as well as the id of that specific item um, and and oftentimes we want to prefer the id over the position for one, um, it may be that items are in a certain order in, let's say, English. It might make sense in, say, Japanese to put the items in the dropdown in a different order. So, you know, you, you don't necessarily, you don't usually want to rely on the position in the dropdown uh, because that may be something that you need to change from language to language. Okay, so, uh, do, 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 toggle buttons. There's, there's these, you can turn on or off, work very similar to checkboxes or switches, uh, but you can kind of see the, the highlighted bar on the bottom or off. Um, I'd say these are more preferred nowadays over, over those is to use the switches. Um, they serve the same purchase um, and you code them the same way on the back end. They just look different. Um, Let me see if there's anything else. So switch, 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 text input. Okay. Um, so the last thing in here to kind of talk about is dealing with the edit text and some of the additional options that are there. Um, so we've seen some of this already. Um, we've seen how to kind of play around with it, set the text, um, and, and set text both that's available in the designer and not visible in the designer. Um, you can also set a hint in there, which is which is the text that would be shown uh, before the user starts typing. Um, it's also possible to have those text text those edit text can either take a single line of text or multiple lines of text. Um, that's an option, and we'll have one of those in the the app that we build. Um, at which point, the enter key on the keyboard, you see kind of the arrow, the green arrow here. Um, so that's what you would press to create another line. Um, so that's there. Um, you can also see on top that there are some suggestions that it gives you as you kind of type. So you, you typically kind of get those automatically. Um, some of the configuration that you have with the, the input type is actually change how it gives those suggestions. Um, so that's, that's one of the things we set the input type for is to change those suggestions. Um, so it used to be when you dra drag and dropped an edit text from the, you know, in the designer, it would start without having an input type set. Nowadays, if you go look at any of those, that text area, you'll notice that we've always started with an input type. And honestly, you usually end up with the, the person name as the default input type. Uh, but you can change that. 
Um, and so, you know, a few different options. There's there's a bunch of different options there, and we've looked at some of them already. Um, text short message is just for giving a short one-line message, whereas short lo text long message is if you want a, a multi-line message like this. Um, Um, so as you have different inputs, um, one of the things that can change is this button down here, right? So, so if it's a multi-line message, you'll see an enter key in that spot um, versus here we have like an emoji key in that spot or here we have this, this checkbox here. So this is, this is done. Um, oftentimes you may also see a little arrow here, which is the next key. So depending on the situation, oftentimes this key will change. Okay, will change what icon it is and what it does. Okay, so, so this button down here we commonly refer to as the action key. Everybody got that? It's the action key. So sometimes it's enter, sometimes it's something else. Um, some keyboards always have an enter key. I think hacker's keyboard always has an enter key and then as well as the action key action key. So sometimes those are um, both always visible. Um, but on most devices, especially out of the box, there's usually just one or the other. Um, so you do have to kind of design around that action key and make sure that things work properly when the user presses it. Um, that's the biggest thing and in terms of dealing with the keyboard, um, the most important thing in terms of usability is to pay attention to how the action key works. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of checkboxes. We'll look at some of those. Um, common ones that um, you might pick from there text cap characters and remember you can combine some of these um, together um, sets says that you want to enter everything wherever they enter in this field is automatically going to be capitalized um, text cap sentences says that well I just want to capitalize automatically capitalize the first letter in a sentence um, there's also text cap words which would just be the you know every every word gets capitalized. So those are, you know, good for when you need that. So for instance, for names, you might capitalize every word. If they're typing in a text message or some other kind of message, you might want to capitalize the beginning of sentences. If it's some sort of identifier, like it's a recovery code um, or a um, other passcode that you've, you've given them, that's where we oftentimes would use cap characters. Uh, Text multi-line, if you need them to enter more than one line with, with enters, um, you can use text password to turn it into a password field, which will hide all but the last um, character. Um, number, if you want to restrict it to the number keyboard, we've used that one already. Um, hint we've done already. Okay. So getting the user's input, we've kind of walked through that. All. We've walked through that previous examples. Um, you're going to say find view by ID. You're going to say edit text dot get text dot two string, and so that will give you the the first give you the character sequence that's in there, and then turn it into a string so you can work with it. Um, and then you oftentimes, if it's a number or things like that, you may need to or a date time things like that, you may need to convert it from there. All right, so customizing the keyboard, and this is part of where things are are new. Um, so there's you know there's some things beyond just input type that you can set, um, which we haven't really looked at yet. Okay, now um, how are people doing? Because this is you know how are people do people do want to finish the the rest of the chapter here? Or do we want to take a break and come back um, right now? How are people feeling on that front? Well, how much is left? Um, this yeah. is the last section. Oh, well, let's finish it. And then what are we doing after we finish chapter labs? We'll do a practical example. Um, oh. I, I think let's go ahead and take a break. This is what we're getting into here is the more important section. So that's that's why I'm like, well, I kind of want to make sure you're paying attention. Um, so, uh, you know, of the stuff in this chapter, starting on this this page here, um, 26, this is probably the most important part of the chapter, just saying.
Um, we'll, we'll come back and talk about the spinner stuff, but there's, there's some really, really important stuff here. Um, I think let's go take a break. We'll come back at two, um, and we'll finish this up and then jump into Android studio to actually build the order screen. All righty. Now, while they're on break, are there any questions I can answer in terms of things that we've talked about already or maybe touched on? None for me. It has mostly to do with the labs that we have. Like one of the okay. things is with the menu, mm -hmm. the, the homepage that I got, okay, uh, that's mm -hmm. dynamically generated content. Someone would add something and then from there would mm -hmm. be the edit button that would show up mm -hmm. or I guess the image of the food could be the edit button, but whatever. In any case, yeah. I, I'm not sure how to wire that up, you know, to do my intents and everything. Is that coming or just, I would, you know, the way I would do that is just I, the same way that, you know, already, you know, use a button, give it a, give a little pencil icon. So you're just going to use a, a button. Um, and, and you click on that button. It takes you to the other screen. Right. So, all right. You That'll already... be replaced later, right? Huh? That would be replaced later, though, right? Because you... each one would become its own little thing. With the recycler view. Yeah. With the recycler view, some things will change, but it actually will be very close. Um, it actually will be very close. The one thing I would say, as far as these labs are concerned, I would stick to three items. If you're showing a list of items, stick to three items. Um, that will mean that you have less, less rework um, when we switch over to recycler view. Okay. All right. So it'll come together later on. Yeah, it'll come together later on. Don't worry okay. too much about thinking too far in the future. It's just going to be a button like you're used to. So okay. All right. We, we shouldn't worry about like dynamic data yet, right? No. Well, what do you mean by dynamic data? Like importing, like, for example, like what I was doing, like shirts and stuff like that. Well, what I mean is you shouldn't hook into eBay. You should hard code in like three items for your project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, don't worry about bringing in data from other resources. If, you know, it may still be dynamic because it may be, it. you know, at this point you already have tools for user adding data and editing data. So you should think about that kind of thing, um, but not data from external resources. So hard-coded data or data that user is changing are both things that you should consider right now, uh, but not data that's like on the internet or in a database.
Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Everybody, everybody here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Cool. So the last section of this is talking more about the keyboard, specifically the um, soft keyboard, software keyboard, um, because what we commonly use in Android is not a hardware keyboard anymore, like um, what was with this Motorola where you had a slide out keyboard. We usually have our, our soft keyboard that takes up space on the screen. And so there's a few things that are that are different about how that operates. Um, you know, first of all, it the fact is that the keyboard's not always visible. Uh, when you have a physical keyboard, keyboard's always visible, so you don't have to worry about that, and you don't have to worry about it covering up your screen. Um, with a software keyboard, it does cover up a sizable portion of your screen, so you got to consider, you know, when is that going to happen, and what is that going to um, what should happen when that occurs and, and how you deal with that. Um, so you really have to design around that. The other thing there, um, if you're dealing with a hardware keyboard, right, all the keys are fixed in place, right? Your Windows key is in a certain place and it does a certain thing. Your at sign is in a certain place and it does a certain thing. And your keys are also always visible. Um, with a software key keyboard, first of all, all of your keys are not always visible. You'll remember that usually to put in a symbol or a number, you usually have to go to a separate um, separate layout. Or if you want to put an emoji, that's usually another separate layout. Or put a GIF. You know, those are those are kind of separate variations of your keyboard per se. Um, you also can the the keyboard can also dynamically rearrange its keys because it's built-in software. And, and so both of those things happen and both of these those things you need to consider. Um, so for instance, with the, let's say you're having the user enter an email address. Well, it's that can be inconvenient because there's always special characters in an email. Uh, namely, pretty much everybody has an at sign and a dot in their email, right? Um, well, by default, that would mean the user kind of kind of type in some keys. They have to switch to symbol mode, pick the at sign, go back to um, go back to letters, type in the rest of their email, go back to symbols, put the dot, and then come back. And and so there's you know the the default keyboard um, with just letters. There's a lot of switching back and forth if you're writing something like an email address. Um, same kind of thing happens if the user is typing in a URL. Um, there's a lot of switching between one keyboard and another. And you want to avoid that as much as possible. So one of the things that's available to you is setting the input type will change how the keyboard looks. So for instance, if you set the key, the input type to text email address, then usually to the left or the right of the spacebar, you'll find that there's an at sign and the other side is the dot. Um, so if you set it to text email address, most users don't even have to switch over to symbols um, to type into their email address, which is a huge benefit. Um, so, you know, things like that you really want to consider as you're determining the type that you're going to use for the input. Um, phone, if you set it to phone, then that will change the keyboard to, to match um, what is traditionally used to dial a phone number. So that's helpful there. Um, date will change it to more fit entering a date in text. Time will change it to more correctly, uh, more easily adding a time in terms of text. You know, so commonly you have slashes in a date. So slash becomes an easy button with date and colon becomes a common button. So colon, colon is kind of takes the plate of so the at sign um, on the time one. Um, then there's also date and time, which includes both of those. Um, we'll talk about on 4.3, how do you actually use um, a date picker and a time picker dialogue, which honestly are, are, are really better in terms of entering both dates and times. Um, but, but those are available there. And the, the thing to be aware, aware of is basically they're there to change the keyboard um, to be something that fits that better. Um, any of these input types, you can use a pipe 
or a Java, you know, Java Bitwise or character to put those together. So for instance, if you want it to be both text autocorrect and text cap sentences, it will put both of those flags there. Okay. Um, and then there's, there's, there's a whole lot of different input types. You can read more about what all of those specifically do in the um, documentation. Um, so we'll use some of those today. We've used some of them already, um, but we're going to continue down that route. So the next topic of discussion is I kind of mentioned, you know, the, again, the keyboard dynamically arranges. So that key in the bottom right where the um, enter key normally would be, um, that is what we call the action key, as I mentioned. That one dynamically changes. So it changes based on what you kind of need to show up there. So sometimes it'll be an enter key, sometimes it will be done, sometimes it will be next. Um, it can also be send or search, um, depending on what your context is. Um, now, by default, what the, the, the built-in behavior of that action key is a few things. If it's a multi-line text, by default, that action key will be enter, um, to enter a new line. Um, if it's not multi-line text, um, then for um, the last input on the on the screen, the last thing it can get focus, it will be the done key. And for all the previous ones, it will be the next key. Does that make sense? So assuming you don't have any multi-lines, it'll be next, 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 done, okay? So what we often do is the one at the end, right, where we want to trigger the action, um, oftentimes we want to change what that icon is or change that to kind of tell the user what the expectation is. So, and the way we set that is by say, by, by changing this option here, IME options. And um, IME, let's see if I can pull this up, is, does it have... Um, forget what that abbreviation is. Um, what is IME? Um, so I'm forgetting what that is. Um, input method editor. Okay. Um, so sometimes you'll find, um, sometimes you'll find in Android, you'll find the term IME, which is what we're seeing here, IME options. Um, so that, that's an acronym for input method editor. That's what I was trying to find. Um, so uh, the way you can think about that, it's just another word for the soft, soft keyboard. Okay. So if you see the word IME, what they're talking about is the soft keyboard. Everybody with me there? IME is the same thing as a soft keyboard. So what we're saying is on the soft keyboard, let's set some options. So here we're saying that the, the action key is going to become the send key. So that's how we change that there. Um, if we want to then listen for that action key, um, what we use is we use an on editor action listener. So we're going to hook this up today. This is one of the things that we need to talk about how to use. Um, so on editor action listener is what you use to respond to the whatever the action key is, whether it's the next key, whether it's the done key, whether it's send, whether it's search. Um, that's how you that's how you handle it is with that listener and like you know this is one of those listeners that you can't hook up in XML um, you do have to hook it up in code cool um, so we'll look at that we'll look at how to kind of set up the um, on a direction listener we need to talk about um, on a direction listener has just one callback method and so that's on editor action um, and so it receives a few different things um, it's going to receive, first of all, the text view, the, the edit field that you entered your, that you were working with, the action ID, which is one of a group of constants. So for instance, here, um, it's editor info, I me action send. So that's if it's the send button. If it was the done button, then it would be I me action done. If it was search, it would be I me action search. Um, and then also in here is the key event. 
um, which goes to like if you're listening for uh, key press or key down events, it gives you some additional information there. Um, and so sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with the action key, um, you do need to pull some data out of that event. Um, most of the times, all you need is all you need to know is just the action ID. But there are some cases where sometimes we may need to inspect that. Um, so that's why that's that what that's why that exists there. Even though most of the time we probably won't use it. Um, so those are those are the things there. Uh, you'll notice that this method returns a boolean. Okay, so a, um, true or false? True says we've handled it. We've done something with it. Um, false says that we we haven't done something with it. You should do the default behavior. So you can kind of think of return true here as kind of like prevent default. Um, that's basically what we're doing. Um, and so part of the default behavior um, with that action key um, is oftentimes to hide the keyboard. Typically, if you press done, it's going to go ahead and hide the keyboard. Um, so if we return false from there, this will not hide the keyboard. Um, so, you know, we may need to play around with that. Sometimes you have to, sometimes you end up needing to return true and then um, hide the keyboard manually, things like that. Um, so one of the things they don't mention here, and, and I do want to go over in our practical example, is, is how to manually tell it to show or hide the keyboard, because um, that's kind of an important thing to understand and play with as you're getting into Android apps. Okay, any questions so far? Before we get into the practical? No, hopefully it all makes sense once we get started with it. The theory stuff, it's hard okay. to, to put together okay. and understand. To, to okay. So what we'll be building today, uh, we started Droid Cafe on, was it Tuesday? Um, so today we'll be kind of continuing with that Droid Cafe project um, and adding this order screen, which we kind of already had started, um, but we'll add some more things to it. Um, so I'm going to open up my project, my, my unit two. I'm going to go to the folder first. It looks like I maybe have some uncommitted things, so I'm going to make sure that those are checked in first. So I'm going to do is I'm going to take Droid Cafe, which right now is under 4.1. I'm going to copy that and paste it into 4.2. Okay. So that's what I'd like you to do with your project as well as your, your other one that you're doing with the worksheet is to take it and copy it from 4.1 to 4.2. Okay. So I'm going to pull that project up now in Android Studio from the, the 4.2 folder instead of the 4.1 folder. So open an existing project. I'm going to go into 4.2, open up Droid Cafe.
and give that a chance to load. So once the project finally loads, I want you to open up the activity order layout because um, that's the one we'll be working with today. And so you can thumbs up the post in Discord when you get there. So that way we're kind of all in sync. So, so what we have so far from what we what we created on Tuesday, we've got a scroll view here, and we've got some text inside of that. And so we used that previously to just show the list of items that the users had ordered. Um, now, I would like to add to that some additional bits so that I can show, you know, I can have the user enter their more information here. So, like their name, their address, their phone number maybe their email address, um, a note about the order, and some chip shipping method. So I want to kind of have some additional controls here. Um, now, um, one way I could approach that, I could toss that all into the scroll view. We could implement it as a, a linear layout. That would be one, be one option. Um, another thing that, but if I wanted to get more complex, that would probably be too restrictive. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to kind of break this up into two layouts as we've done previously. Um, so I'm going to have one that's kind of going to be a sub layout that's going to represent everything that goes into the scroll view. And then we're going to have um, this larger layout that is the screen. Okay. So I'm actually going to break this up into two layouts at this point. So the place I'm going to start, we've got activity order, right? Um, I'm going to create another layout, and I'm going to call it um, specifically, I'm going to call it content main. Um, so anytime I have this, I always start, anytime I have this situation, I'm always going to start that new layout with the name content. So activity is if it's at the root. Content is if it's kind of inside of there. So we're going to have content order is I'm going to make a new layout there. And so that's going to be based on a constraint layout. Okay. Um, so things I need in there, I, I need to get my order text, because I still need to have that in there. So I'm going to drag that in, call that order text. So it matches up with what I had previously. Um, it's going to complain that I already have that name. That's okay. I'm going to go ahead and hit continue on that. So I'm going to put that in as order text. Um, specifically, I need to use that name because I used that on the previous one here. I had already called it order text, so I'm sticking with that name. Uh, I'm going to put in there, just like I did on Tuesday, I'm going to change this to my cart in the um, designer version of the text. Okay. And I kind of want to work my way down um, through the different controls that we're going to add. Okay, so so let's say we start up at the top, and so I want to put in the name field. So I need a, a text view there, and I need an edit text for the name. I need to probably make sure that I'm okay. I'm already on the Nexus S. That's good. Um, I need to bring in another text view 
and an edit text for the address, um, one more for the phone number, another field for the phone number. Um, I'm actually going to put another one in here for the email address and a field for that. How come we're putting the edit text and the text view next to each other? I thought that was bad practice. It's bad practice. Yes, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm just dragging the controls in first and we can put them in the right place then in a second. Um, so we've got, that was the email field. Um, and so I need my note field. And then I need my delivery mode. And finally, the radio buttons here. Um, buttons. OK, so I need a radio group. And I want to make that a little bit bigger. So I'm going to drag that out so I can actually get into it. And so I'm going to put my radio buttons inside of that radio but group using the component tree on the left. So radio button, radio button, radio button. OK. So now we have, make this a little bit bigger so I can see everything that's there. Okay, so I have how many text views here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven text views, um, and five and in, five input boxes. Okay, so yeah, um, the the way they show it here in the mockup, you can see that they're left and right of each other, right? Um, you can also notice that as they did the mockup. Notice that they're not lined up, how they're kind of jagged. Um, so that's, if you are going to line them up, if you are going to put them like this, it's generally not considered good UX in terms of having them not lined up. Usually users expect them to be lined up if you are going to do that. Um, I would say though, in terms of mobile application development, um, this is always a bad idea. Now, I've said this a few times in previous lectures, and, and you kind of alluded to this, Paul. Why did I say that this, doing it this way is a bad idea? It's just hard to line it up. It just doesn't look professional. Okay, so lining it up is a difficulty, okay? And it does need to be lined up. What else? It's not the first time we've talked about it. Um, I, I would just say it's not what the user expects. I mean, when I really think okay. about it, my They're, filling out forms and that, it's it's always the label and then mm -hmm. underneath it rather than the label. There is, there is one reason that you should never do it this way, and it's not a personal preference thing. And I mentioned this a few times. So the thing to recall, recall that when we're building Android apps, especially, we need to think about the fact that this is probably not just going to be in English. Everybody with me there? We're probably going to need to translate this application. So in one of the things that commonly happens, let's say in, let's say in, um, English, it's, well, the, my label here is, is four characters, you know, note. Okay. Well, what happens if in another language, the same text is four words long? Then they can't type it in. Or like overlap. Right. Well, what are my options then? Okay, I don't want it to overlap. That's what one one thing. OK. 
Okay, what could I do so it doesn't overlap? Move the edit text underneath. Okay, I could do that, and and that would be the way I would recommend it. A lot of times, the way that in in I, the reason I the reason I harp on this so much is because um, this is this is the way that I learned how actually to do when I learned how to build UIs and you know because this is this is the way I learned to do it was left and right um, and because um, that historically was the way that you built Windows app that was the norm um, for many many years. Um, the problem is that you know. A, it doesn't work well on mobile because of screen size limitations. B, it doesn't work well from for the translation points. Um, so one of the things that you know commonly people then do is like, well, I'll just wrap the words, you know, and I'll do it like this. And so now I've got a label. Okay, well, it's a little bit harder to read because it's now um, because of the word wrapping and and. The word wrapping only works as long as you have, you still end up, you're restricted to the longest word in there. Um, but now you have a label that's that's much taller, which then also potentially breaks your layout. Um, because in this, in this thing, it's not only sensitive, these tend to not just be sensitive to the width of your labels, but it also be, tends to be sensitive to the height of them. That can break your layout as well, because then maybe this is overlapping the next control, okay? So simply because of because if you ever want to take this and turn it into a language other than English, um, this is always a bad idea in any other language. Um, and, and the other thing is, you know, even if you're not translating it into English, your UIs are not static. App applications are constantly changing. Um, you're going to be adding more controls oftentimes to screens. So um, this, this kind of layout tends to be hard to adapt to changes. Does that make sense? Changes in any way, shape, or form. Is everybody hearing me? You. Am I speaking to the choir or? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so I, you know, nowadays I don't write, regardless of what device I'm targeting, um, I have gotten out of the habit of doing doing that um, because I've just been burnt by it too much in in a variety of different apps where it ends up just in the long term it ends up not working. Um, so so what I'm going to do here instead is I'm just going to take my my edit text and slot it underneath there. And that minor change of of slotting the um, edit text under the um, under the label, as it turns out, it solves all of the problems. And, and so that's why I, I stress that um, because it actually does solve all of your UI problems and it actually really doesn't come with much of a negative other than that your UIs become taller. Um, and, and so the, the taller does mean that you're more likely going to end up with the scroll view um, in there. And, and so that you know that is a potential downside. Um, but more often than not, you know, it's it's a worthy trade-off. Um, now I'm going to go up to a larger screen size here, um, so I can design this. Um, obviously, I'm going to put this into a scroll view, so that'll be fine. Um, I just don't have the scroll view in here to easily design it as is. Um, so I'm going to jump up to the the Nexus Seven um, and put that into portrait mode, so I can move these controls around. Um, to be um, easier to work with. Hey, Mr. Smith, I, yep. I got a issue. I don't know if it's this yep. buggy Android Studio, but I'm dragging these edit text over, and uh -huh. that line in the name thing, it doesn't show up, even when I put in the text field for both of those some text. Your which which line? Uh, any of the edit text. None of it works. Okay. I'm just dragging the plain text over. What, what do you think that is? Um, so it's just showing name with no shows nothing. It's just it looks blank. I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. What I would say is what what you want to do though um, is once you get it in, um, regardless of how it came in, is you want to go into it, remove the text here, and I'm going to put some text into the second one, the wrench text. 
Um, so here we might say John Doe. That doesn't work. What doesn't work? I put text and it doesn't show up. You put text and it doesn't show up. Is it inside of something else? Inside the constraint layout? Is it, yeah, is it inside the constraint layout or is it inside another layout? No, it's in the constraint layout. Okay. Straight is up. the, what is the width and height of it? Is it wrap content and wrap content? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Okay. I don't, I don't know offhand, but I can't, I can't spend too much time on it. Cause okay. All right. I'm I gonna handle to, it. We need to have everybody kind of yeah. working. Okay. So I just need to add some constraints. So I'm going to do that kind of as I've done previously. I'm going to put three constraints on each of these things, um, top, bottom, uh, left and right. And you'll notice I don't put a, um, I'm not going to put a bottom constraint on any of these because it's going to end up going into that scroll view. So we're just taking the time to constrain them right now. Yep. Just taking the time to constrain them, and then we'll come back and we'll configure them all one by one. And so that radio group is kind of the hard one. I have to select it via the component tree. If I select it in here, it seems to always get the, the radio buttons, not the group. Okay, so now that I've got all of those um, constrained, I want to set their widths. So I'm going to set all of their widths to match constraint. And I'm going to set all of their heights to wrap content. Everybody got that width of width of um, match constraint, height of wrap content. Well, I'm still catching up. Okay. Um, I think I still need to go back through. I didn't set any of those. I didn't set my default margin before I started that, so I still have to go through all of these and give them some margin. And so I'll just do a margin of eight on all three sides. How did you move the radio buttons without screwing them up? Um, very carefully. I clicked the radio group here in uh, okay. the component tree rather than doing it through, okay. um, rather than doing it here in the designer and dragging it. And 
so that radio group 888. And so there's no constraint down on the, the bottom side of the radio group. But everything, but everything here has a top left and right constraint. Now, kind of working my way down and setting some designer text for each of these. So I'm going to say my cart there, this label, I want that to be name. And John Doe, and this would be address. And I might change this to be St. Louis. Um, this one is the phone number, so phone, and maybe this one is 555-1234. Um, this one would be the email address. And this is the email. So john.doe at example.com. Um, next up, this is the note. Um, and in here, I'm going to just put some more Mipsum. This is choose a delivery method. And so the three different delivery methods that are available um, are same day messenger service um, next day ground delivery and pickup The te mm -hmm. edit text; those are three constraints, right? And we're we're um, matching matching the parent, right? Yeah. So all all three of them have all all of them have both the edit text and the text views have three constraints: top left, um, top top left and right, and they're just to the closest thing that's there. So left and right of the screen and top and to the top of the control that's above it. So left and right are parent, but the, the top is relative to wherever is above. Um, now with each of the buttons, I need to make sure that they have the right sizes. So the three radio buttons, they should be match parent for the width and wrap content for the height. That's because the radio group that they're in is effectively a linear layout, so it uses match parent instead of match constraint. Which was that again? Um, on the three radio buttons, they should have a width of match parent and a height of wrap content. Oh, OK. I guess I had that done. Hmm. Yeah. They should be that by default. Um, they just might have gotten changed as you were dragging things around, which is why I mentioned to make sure that they're that. OK. Um, other things I might want to do, um, I probably want to increase the font size of the text up at the top and the text over the delivery method. So over the delivery method, or sorry, for the, the cart contents up at the top, maybe I'll, let's try 20 SP. We'll see what that looks like. Yeah, that looks about good. So I'm going to do 20 SP there, and I'm also going to do 20 SP here. 
and re leave the rest as is at 14. Okay. Um, I still need to go through each of these and set their IDs. Um, so I've already set the top one as order text and because that came with what we had set up on Tuesday. Um, with the name, I'm going to do this one as name text. Yes, refactor. This is going to be the name edit. So I just need to go through each of these and set their IDs one by one. So address text. Um, address edit. And phone text. Phone edit. This is the email text. The email edit. This is the um, note edit, and did I set the, I skipped the text view right above it, so it needs to be note edit, or note text. Okay, and delivery, delivery text, um, this would be the delivery group. So do you want to give that an ID? This would be um, same day delivery. This would be next day delivery. And this would be pickup delivery. Okay, so everything's got an ID and everything has some text. All right, uh, give me like a yeah. minute or so to get caught up. No problem. Just a matter of, you know, kind of things like this is just a lot of like typing and, and just kind of a lot of grunt work to get the UI in and just making sure that, that everything's set up correctly. But, you know, it's a good thing to get quick at because you'll find yourself doing a lot of this kind of things, you know, professionally and for, for labs, you know, being able to get the stuff done quickly and correctly is, is pretty important. So one of the things that I've done here kind of as I built it, I made sure that all of my controls here on the left were organized in the same way from top to bottom as they are on screen. Um, so I don't have all my text views grouped together. I don't have all my edit text grouped together. Um, that helps to at least hint to Android, you know, what the correct tab order is for them.
So anybody still going on this? Still getting caught up? Yeah, we can proceed. I got mostly done. Okay. I'm going to change the, the last thing I want to do here before we go on to the next thing. Because um, there's, there's still some layout stuff that we need to do. But I want to change all the input types on these um, to reflect um, what, they, what they need to be. So starting with the top one, which is the name. Uh, we can kind of look at that one. Right now it's, it's set to text person name. That's exactly what I want it to be. So I'm going to leave that as, as text person name. Uh, next thing would be the address. Um, there I want to change the flag. So I'm, I'm going to uncheck text person name. And I'm going to check text postal address. Um, apply. Okay, so that one is text postal address. Um, the next one would be text phone or just phone okay so we got phone and then this one would be email address which it is already text email address um, and then finally the note uh, uncheck that one because I want this to be text long message long message because it's going to be um, multi-line hit apply okay so that's how I've set up the different input modes hey you may have answered this before what's that yeah. wrench thing up the top where the battery indicator is in the Wi-Fi in the view um this yeah that what does that do um toggle tools visibility and position um i don't actually know that was added pretty recently i'm not entirely sure what that's supposed to do i think that was added in the last year or so I don't. I, I'm not entirely sure what that's what that's supposed to be. So sorry. I don't. I don't have an answer for that one. All right. Um, on the last last one, I'll come back to that. Okay. So we've got the fields in there, um, and we may need to come back and change a few things, but but that's good for now. Um, I'm going to go back to um, activity order, and we haven't changed anything on this front yet. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to get that layout that we just created inside of the scroll view. Okay, so that's my goal. Um, the other thing I need to do is right now there's not a button to actually place the order. Um, so I do want to add that in, and I'm going to add that in as an FAB. Um, so first things first, I'm going to switch over to the code view. Okay. So again, this is on activity order, not content order. Um, so inside of the scroll view, currently we have this edit text. I'm going to get rid of that. And inside of there, I'm going to put an include tag instead. So include and we're going to include the layout content order which we just created and set the width of that to match parent the height to uh, wrap content and then close that tag what did you delete out of there um, i deleted the the text view that was there uh, okay what's the reason for that um because i moved it over to the other layout it's over at the top of the other layout now. Okay. So over in content order, this top one where it says my cart, I called that order text. That's replacing what was there. Okay. So. Did we delete out a linear layout inside the scroll view? Um, I did that yesterday. Okay. I can delete it right here. That, yeah. That, uh, yeah. You can just... Tag. You can just delete it in code. Um, so I would just go over to the code view and, and say this is, should be the only thing inside of the scroll view. Okay. 
And so if you've got all that right, in the designer it would, should look something like this, where you're seeing now all the, in the component tree, um, you see constraint layout, the scroll view, and then the include tag, but you're kind of seeing a preview of the entire screen with the other um, layout inside of it. Can you go back to the include tag? Yep. So the reason I needed to split those two things up again was because I wanted to have it inside of a scroll view, but I still want to be able to use the constraint layout. And um, right now we're not really functionally using the constraint layout. We're going to come back in in a minute um, later here and and put in a, a spinner. And when we do that, then you know having a constraint layout is going to make that a lot easier. Okay, I'm good. Okay. So the last thing I need to do with this layout is add that FAB. Um, so I'm going to drag that in. And I'm not going to drag it over here. I'm going to drag it down here into the component tree. Okay. And so from there, oh, I need an icon. I don't have my icon yet that I want. Um, so I'm going to say new vector asset. Um, and we will probably want an icon for purchasing. Let's see if there's something else that I can get. What's the icon that I want for, for buy? Maybe is there a dollar sign or something? Oh, there we go. That'll work. So I'll use attach money as my icon. Attach money, I'll call that my buy. Oh, and I hit escape on that. That was not what I wanted to do. Um, one more time, how did you get to that? You just clicked over your floating action button. Um, so I I didn't put the floating action button in yet. I'm going to add over to Drawable and right click there and say um, new image, new vector asset. So I'm call that IC buy and finish. So again, that's the, the attach money icon. That's the one I added as my IC buy. Um, so once I've got that in there, um, now I can drag the icon in. So I'm going to drag it over here onto the constraint layout on the left in the component tree. And so IC buy, bring it in there, and then I'm going to anchor it to the top right corner of the screen. And so if you have it right, um, the constraints should be listed to end of parent and top of parent. Should not be anchored to the scroll view. Okay. Any questions? Everybody tracking along? Yeah. Okay. Um, now, sometimes you may want to have the icon appear sort of above and and over the um, over this line. That's a common thing that's done. Um, if I remember right, though, I think I need a. I think I have to have a coordinator layer for it to do that. Um, but let me check real quick. If I go to here, um, let me anchor that there. Oh, yeah. Um, but then it doesn't, it goes behind. Yeah, so I think I just want to not do that right here. Okay, we'll come back to that later. Um, so oftentimes what you'll see is they kind of, if we're putting an FEB up in the top right corner, um, we'll commonly put it over there. Um, in order to do that, we have to kind of set up some additional things, which I don't really want to, I don't, we don't really have time to get into all of the how to do that. So I'm just going to leave it down here. 
Okay. Um, but the main thing that we're after is that it has mm-hmm. to be above where it says order scroll view, right? Yes. It needs to not be inside of the scroll view. Um, and so this would be, I, I need to change the ID of that because I didn't change that yet. Um, the ID needs to be, um, needs to be uh, by. Order, order fab. I'm going to call it by fab because I can't remember if I called the other one um, order fab. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to do to set that up. Um, yeah, the common, the, the important thing it needs to be up there and, and anchored to the top right. Um, the reason I'm anchoring it to the top right corner and not the bottom left, bottom right corner is because my, my, um, my keyboard will be down here. So if I had it down here, then it would be covered by the keyboard versus if it's up here, then it won't be covered by the keyboard. Okay. So so that's the reason for putting it up on the top right corner. Okay. Um, so now let's think about how we're going to implement a few of those things. Um, I do definitely want to activate some code um, whenever the user um, presses the buy button. So I am going to put an on click on that one. So in the code, I'm going to say Android on click. And so we're going to say when that happens, then we're going to do on buy. And um, create the on buy method. OK. And then going back to content order, I'm also going to hook up on click for the three delivery options. Um, so in the code, for each of those three radio buttons, I'm going to say um, Android on click. And so this would be on on um, same day, or no, on delivery mode, because I'm going to use the same method for all three. So on delivery mode, um, Alt Enter. One click event handler in the order activity. I have to find out which one. Yep, so I want to make sure that those go into the order activity and then it's going to be on delivery mode through all three of those radio buttons. So they're going to have the same method that they're going to go to. Okay. I'm not getting the pop up to do the alt enter for delivery mode. Um, when you when I did the alt enter, it looked a little bit different. I had to say create on click event handler, and then go into here. So it looks a little bit different because we're in content order and not activity order. And then you sent that to the main activity or order activity. Order activity, order activity, because this this layout will be used for the order activity. Yeah, we just need one, right? Because it's the same yeah. for each of them. Yeah, Do the same for all three okay. of them. Yeah. I should probably have called that on click delivery mode. Which maybe I'll just change that real quick. On click delivery mode. So over an order activity, I should have these two stubs now, one for on buy and one for on click delivery mode. Okay, now that we've got those two stubs in place, um, I'm going to go up to the top and we're going to start hooking in all of the controls. So I need to get all of the different pieces that, uh, all the different inputs, um, so I can refer to those in my on by method.
and do something there. So in here, we want to say private, and I want to kind of go through each of the fields one by one. So I need, looking at the designer, I need a few different edit texts. So the first one's going to be my name. So edit text, and this would be the name edit. Um, next one would be my address edit. So edit text, address, edit. Next would be the phone edit. So edit text there. Um, beneath that, I have an email, so I need my email edit. Next up would be my uh, da, 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 would be my note. So note edit. Um, in here, I've got the radio group, so private uh, radio group um, delivery group. And then I want the radio buttons, so radio button uh, same day delivery private radio button uh, next day delivery private radio button uh, pickup delivery so I'm just creating fields um, to refer to all of those different controls there. Um, so once I've created all those fields, I'm just going to use find view by ID to get each of them one by one. And that's down in my on create. So name edit is equal to find view by ID or dot ID dot name edit. We've got the address edit. And so find view by ID or dot ID dot address edit. Um, we've got the phone number. So phone edit find view by ID. Um, and the email edit, find view by ID, hard ID, dot email edit, um, note edit is equal to find view by ID, hard ID, dot note edit. Um, and then I need all the radio things. So uh, delivery group is equal to find view by ID r dot ID dot delivery group. The same day delivery is equal to find view by ID r dot ID dot same day delivery. And we've got the next day delivery. So next day delivery is find view by ID R to ID dot next next day delivery um, pickup is find view by ID R to ID dot pickup. I think that's all of my controls. Okay, so I'll give you guys a few minutes to catch up with all of that.
with uh, my installation problem mm -hmm. with the Android Studio, what's yep. with just uninstalling and reinstalling doing that, or would I really screw things up with that? Because I don't think I can download the same version again, right? I did find a way because Mo just had the same problem. We did find a way to get four one one on his laptop yesterday. Oh, okay. What was the reason for having to do that? Um, having to do what? Uh, to 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 install it again. Was he having graphics problems or? Um, that... because he just hadn't had it on his laptop. He had it on his desktop, but not his laptop yet. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So. It wasn't that it was a problem. It just was never installed. So we okay. did find a way to do that. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can direct me to a link or assist me with it, but these uh, these little problems are starting to add up, you know, okay. like the, the fab button wasn't showing the other day. Now I can't see in the edit text and it's, yeah, it's. I can send you the link, Paul, here in a second. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you know, basically, what we've done here is is most of the stuff we've kind of already covered, right? And so it's just kind of review to kind of figure out how to do this, but with a larger example, um, with a larger screen. Um, so the next thing I want to do is to kind of start to hook up some of the logic. Um, before I do, I probably should go and test the app just to make sure that we haven't broke anything at this point. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run the app. I'm going to see if anything, you know, see how it's behaving right now before you hook up any of the um, on-click logic or any of the other listeners um, just to see what's happening out of the box. Um, so I'm going to wait until that, that finishes building and run. Okay, so... I can click on the donut and the froyo, and then those both should be in my cart, which shows up at the top. Donut added a cart, froyo added a cart. Um, I can see that there's the different fields. My scroll view is working. My FAB is floating on top, so that's all good. You know, that's that's what I want to see. Um, I can click the different radio buttons and switch through. Um, you'll see initially. There was nothing selected in terms of the radio buttons, um, but as soon as I, you know, once I select one, there's no way to go back to nothing being selected. Does that uh, animation come default with those? Yeah, that comes built in. That's wild. Yeah, you don't have to do anything to, to get those animations. They just come, which is great. Um, that's by virtue of being, those were those kind of animations and stuff was introduced with Android 5.0. Um, with all the material design stuff that came in there. So as of 5.0 or higher, you get all those those animations like that baked in. They really do make it easy to develop on Android. So um, one thing to check, and we kind of talked about how the keyboard changes from different ones. So we, we had already checked in the input types. We've changed those so we can kind of see how that behaves now. So if I go to the name field, um, we can see that it's kind of the, the default, the normal input. Um, you can see that there's this button here, which looks kind of an, like an arrow and a bar. Everybody see that same thing on their device? I have it on my yeah. Um, may or, this may end up looking a little bit different if you're using your physical device and not an emulator, but it should have roughly the same behavior. Um, so this is this is the next button. So if I click that, that's going to basically change focus off to the next item, right? So I can click that. I'm in address now. It hasn't really changed, but if I go to phone number, okay. So now we've got the phone keyboard, right? So that's you know that's kind of where we were talking about getting different keyboards. Um, if I go to the next one here, right, so now I'm on the email address, you should see that there's an at sign on the left and there's a dot here. Does everybody have that same thing, at sign, period? You should notice oh, yeah. that that's different from, say, having the address field. The address field doesn't have that. It's got a comma and a dot. Um, so that's that's what you get from setting the input type to email address. It doesn't do any validation to make sure that it's a valid email address. It just makes it a different keyboard. That's all that does. Um, and then going to note, when I look at note, um, you should see that the, the icon changes to this um, different 
check mark, right? So the check mark is is that this is the done button, right? So all the previous fields we had a next button. Here we have a done, and so done is going to close the keyboard. Uh, but as it is right now, clicking done doesn't do anything other than close the keyboard. So that's where we can kind of see, you know, part of what's happening with the keyboard so far. Okay. Um, so next thing I want to do is kind of hook up some events to, you know, when different things happen in my UI. Um, so maybe I'm going to start with my delivery mode. I'm going to start with the the different checkboxes here. Um, so let's say, you know, we've already hooked up this on-click delivery mode, and so what I want to do is I'm just going to tell it to show a toast. Um, containing the the text of the item item you clicked on, so this and view dot get text. Um, well, I want to get the text, but I need to cast it to a text view, or I could just cast it to a radio button. So maybe I'll do that up here. Um, radio button. And so maybe I'll say radio is equal to cast it to a radio button using the, the view that they clicked. Okay. Because then I can just use that down here. So radio dot get text and toast dot uh, link. Uh, short. Oh, I need to write toast. Toast dot length short dot show. So what that should do is show um, the text of whatever radio button you click on. So same day, next day, or pick up. And you'll notice you can either click on the text, the label works, um, or clicking on the circle. Either of those should either of those should trigger the method. Um, now it's worth noting if I go up here and kind of focus, if I hit tab to kind of go through these. Um, so you'll notice tab does not um, trigger it as I'm changing focus. Um, if I were to go down here and click enter on pickup, Okay, so the click event still fires in that case. Um, now, one of the things I mentioned is the, the timing of that is kind of interesting. You'll also notice because I tab through, notice that the soft keyboard didn't go away as I'm tabbing through these, um, tabbing through the radio buttons. Is everybody see that? Yeah. So, How did you tab through them? I just press the tab key on my keyboard because I'm using the emulator. Um, the you, tab key on, on your my, on oh, my keyboard. Oh, you mean on your computer there. On my computer, right. So you won't have that option. You, you don't have that option if you're on your physical device. Um, but that's, you know, things to consider if the user has a Bluetooth device. Right. If the blue, if the user's got a Bluetooth keyboard, you may need to have this. You may need to have have some, think about those kind of things, because um, that may not be the the ideal behavior. Um, one thing to note: um, you can always hit the the back arrow here to get the keyboard to dismiss if you need to do that. Um, that is an option. Um, okay. So we've got the kind of the radio button. We can see if I if I click on it when I select the new thing, it's going to give my toast to pop up. Um, another way that I can hook up and listen for when that changes, let me comment this out real quick so we can see the other method. Um, I can go back up to on create. I'm going to say delivery group. Let's set on check changed listener okay and so this way it will actually hook up to all the three different fields and so I'm gonna say new 
uh, radio group on check change listener. So there's a lot it kind of put in there already. Um, what I'm doing here, this radio, new radio group on check chain listener, this is an interface. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm kind of defining, defining a class that implements that interface. Um, it's what we refer to as anonymous, an anonymous class because I've not given this class a name. So inside here, I can say, well, let's do something um, when the particular item ch is changed. So for instance, if, if I want to say um, change it here, we might say switch and we'll change on the checked item ID. Mr. Smith, how did yep. you type that so fast? I looked away, I guess I didn't see what you did. There. So I typed in this method and then I typed in, I can kind of backtrack. So what I typed in was actually much shorter. So I said on uh, checked, actually I think I said new, new, and you kind of see, can see it suggesting, you see that floating up there? New, okay. Um, new, and then I just typed on, on, and it actually figured it out here. So I'm using IntelliSense here, radio group on check change listener, and that generates all that code. So I don't need to type all of that. I just need to say new on and let it give me the rest. Uh, it's not doing that for me, but that's all right. I'll figure it okay. out. Well, that's 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 what you want to end up with in here. So what we want to do is is a switch on the checked ID. If I remember right, that's the ID of the particular uh, radio button that got checked. So I might say case um, if it's RID same day delivery then I might want to show a toast with that text. So I might say toast um, dot make text this and maybe I'll just say for now same day and toast dot length short dot show break and anyone in another case for the other two what in the world okay and so the first ones same day then I've got pickup and then I've got in here I'm gonna say next day and here I'm gonna say pickup Now why, why is it not happy? Okay, so here's a kind of interesting quirk, right? So you'll notice that I have this red underline and you probably have this if you're coding along. Does everybody see that? Yep. Okay, so it says it cannot resolve, make text, um, and then there's a long sort of message there, okay? Now, don't let your eyes glaze over the details that you want are in there. So it's it's saying make text. What's that first thing that's in there? Well, it says on check chain listener. It says anonymous on check change listener. And then the next thing is a string and then it's an int. So what it's saying is is there's there's no method that matches the signature. Okay? There's no method that matches the arguments that we're giving it. Is everybody with me there? So the problem is that this, remember, this refers to the object that you're in. This has changed. The meaning of the word this has changed. Um, you remember how I said that here I'm defining an anonymous class? So I'm creating a new object here. So now this refers to this listener, not to our activity. Is everybody with me there? 
This refers to our listener, not to our activity. Does everybody see why that's a problem? Yeah. So our listener is not a context. Um, so the way I need to resolve that is um, by telling it which version of this do I want it to use. So by default, it uses the one that's closest to where you write it. Um, but I can have it use one at a farther out scope um, in Java. And the way I do that is I use the name of the class dot this. So we are in order activity dot Java. Everybody see that? So the way I refer to that class is order activity dot this. That's what I need to do to dis disambiguate it. So that's kind of a an interesting gotcha anytime you're writing um, anonymous classes like this, oftentimes this becomes a, you know, the keyword this becomes a problem and, and that's how you, that's how you deal with it is you refer to, you tell it which, which class are you're actually referring to. Uh, why, I, I don't get it. Why would it matter? I mean, you're in order activity. Of course it's this. What else would it be? I'm no longer in order activity. That's the difference. I'm not in order activity anymore. How's that? I, I'm, I'm not seeing that because we're in the, the file. Mm -hmm. activity. We're in the file order activity, but I just started a new class. When I said new radio, radio group on check change listener, okay. this right here, that's a class. That right there is a class from line 46 to 61. I've just defined another class. Because it's a capital R radio group. Uh, it's a capital R on check change. This is this is ignore that for a moment. This the reason that that's there is because this this interface is nested inside of the radio group. The radio group class. It's not an instance of radio group. It's, it's not class. an instance of ra radio group. It's an instance of on check change listener. Okay. It's an instance within radio group class. Okay. Yeah. The, All right. There's, there's a few things happening here. This is it's defined. You have a nested class that they have defined. Um, so if I were to go to the definition here, inside of radio group Java. They've nested an interface on check change listener inside of that. Do you see that? Okay, I understand that. So this is this is a nested interface, and we're implementing that nested interface with an anonymous class. Anonymous because it hasn't get, been given a name. Yeah, it's not like you typed radio group radio small r yeah. radio group equals new radio group i haven't said i haven't said public class right i haven't said class class name or extends or implements i'm just implementing it here and so um, if you look at the files that this generates um, this will actually generate a as a class file um, so let's say i i run the app if i were to actually go look at some of the directories here um, let me go to the project view. I can kind of show you where this is at. App build. Uh, is it under generated? No, I don't think it's under generated. I think it's under outputs. Oh, yeah, it's. Where is it? Intermediates, maybe? I forget where the these things are at. Anyway, there would be a separate class file. Um, so, and, and typically that typically that class file that gets generated for this um, would be something like order activity dollar sign one. Um, but I'm not I'm not finding it at the moment. I forget where they put it. Okay. Um, well, what I 
what I wanted to know is like the new radio group by itself. That yeah. that right there just being anonymous. Yeah, this updated. means a new this 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 means that's the way you think about it. Is this is a new class that I'm declaring in line. Um, so it's kind of a it's kind of a quirk of Java that Java doesn't really have the idea of um, functions as objects. Really, everything that you if you want to create something, you have to make a class. Um, and so Java, as of Java eight, does have something called does have a lambda syntax. Um, a lambda syntax is just shorthand for this. Um, so you kind of saw, you know, what we have right now. If I click on any of the items, you can see it says the the text same day, next day, or pickup. Um, so you neither use a set on check change listener like this to listen to everything in the group, or you can hook up individual like on click listener to the different buttons. Um, so either of those approaches work. Um, sometimes, you know, oftentimes this ones can be a little bit easier to set up depending on your particular conditions, um, or or sometimes this may be easier to set up. It really depends on what you're doing. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that you know how to do both of those things. And, and you know, so we're kind of getting started into talking about how to hook up listeners in, in Java, right? Dynamically. Okay. Um, so that's, that's how you do that. Um, real quickly here, I'm just going to show you how you would turn this into um, a Lambda function. Um, so I'm going to comment out what I have here. Do you want us to follow along or is this more of just a visual? This is more visual. You don't need to follow along with this part. I just want to show you how you would translate it over. So with Java 8, the Lambdas, and this is kind of like you saw in JavaScript, um, where you have an arrow function. And so what you do is it's a shorthand for writing an anonymous class like this. It only works as long as that, um, that interface only has one method, which, which is the case here. Um, it doesn't work for everything because not everything has just one method. So basically what I'm implementing is this on check changed um, function. So you'll see the on check changed has two parameters. So I'm going to pull that out. And so I'm going to do on check changed there, arrow. And oh, and I think I have to do it without data types. Is that right? No, that's not right. What is it complaining about? Cannot resolve symbol group. Why, why does it not like my syntax? What did I get wrong? Oh, because they use a different arrow. So um, Node uses the arrow of equals greater than, Java uses the arrow as dash greater than. Um, so that's little syntactic bit, bit that gets confusing. Um, so in here I can just say toast Um, make text and kind of do the same thing and I might say this and boo 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 uh, lambda and toast dot length long um, Wait a minute, you don't need the switch? Well, I do need the switch. I'm just shorthanding it to show what's here. And what did I, what did I mess up? Oh, I didn't call show. And I wanted to have that actually be short. Short. Oh. Length short. Yeah. So, you can shorthand that there. And so you'll notice, so this does the, you know, if I, yes, I still need the switch statement. There's no way to get around the, the switch statement here, really. Um, but you'll notice that 
um, you'll notice that I don't have to, for instance, disambiguate the this. Should we just use that? It seems like that's just easier, and it's the way this, things are going, right? Yeah, uh, this is the way things are going. This is the way things are going. Um, the one thing you'll notice there is that there's not necessarily a lot of, of guidance in terms of converting it. Um, there's a little bit more that you maybe have to know to do yourself about converting it. Um, I think that there is, I think if you start with this syntax, I feel like I can do alt enter and I think there is a way to convert it over there. Yeah, so if you do alt enter in here, Android Studio can do the conversion. You can say replace with Lambda and it'll actually, yeah, it just did it there. So yes, this is this is kind of the direction that things are going. So if you want to write your, your listeners that way, um, by all means, be my guest. Um, but this is kind of the the old way of writing it. Okay, so you'll see um, this is this is the syntax that you'll see in the book. All right. So I will take either one. If you want to write it with as anonymous classes here, I'll take that. If you want to write it as um, a lambda function, I'm totally okay with that as well. Um, so, but yeah, I would say that it's the 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 world of Java is definitely going over to that. Um, so if you Jonathan, you're asking about how to convert it. Um, you just go up here to where I say radio group on check chain listener. I'm going to hit Alt Enter, and you see how it pops up with replace with Lambda. That's all you've got to click. And so that will convert it from the old style to the the Lambda style. Um, so that's that's really all you got to do there is the compiler can kind of take care of it for you. Um, which of those two is easier to read is kind of subjective. I would say, you know, there's a lot less code in the, the second variation. So um, that can be easier on the eyes. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's nice to have all the details and the data types and things like that. Um, okay. Um, other things we might want to do is we might want to handle when events happen with the individual fields. Um, so I'm going to do that now as well. Um, now, in order to do that, um, I want to actually hook up a, a listener to all of the fields, and I'm actually going to use the same listener. So I'm going to put it in a variable um, before I hook it up, and that way I can reuse it. Um, if you put it directly into the, the function, obviously, then, then you can't reuse it. You would have to recreate it. Um, so, so here I'm going to say I want a um, text view. I believe it is text view. This is where uh, you start coding again, right? Yeah, this is this is where you want to get back to following me. So text view auditor action listener, and this I'm going to call my editor listener or my edit listener. And here I'm going to say new on editor action listener. So same kind of thing as we did previously. Um, again, this is one you can do as a lambda um, because it only takes because um, it's only a single function. So you can do this conversion over as a um, as a lambda if you want to. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so you should end up something like that. But I'm going to roll that back because that didn't exactly do what I would like it to do. I'd like to have it still curly braces. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna work with it this way for the for the moment. Um, okay, so what we want it to do, um, I'm gonna start with again, kind of like where I've start with the others. I'm just gonna have it show a toast um, when something occurs. Um, so for instance, here I'm gonna say if the action ID is equal to um, editor info dot IME action next then we're gonna just show a toast that says next and if it's done then I'll show one that says done and I 
I guess this can be. There. I'll just do it that way. You should read. Okay. And kind of as we saw with the the previous one, in order to disambiguate the this, I would need to write that as order activity dot this. So everybody tracking with me so far? So I'm making a handler. It's going to show a toast that says next if you press the next key, or it's going to show a done if you do the done action. How did you get that to do the automatic thing? Like, mm -hmm. It's just not working for me. I'm typing exactly what you got. And mm -hmm. it's... So I, I this first part I had to type out. Right. Yeah. And then I said new, and then I started typing on editor action listener. And that's when the prompt came up. Yep. All right. I, didn't, I did have me. to type in the word new. Mr. Smith, I'm yep. getting uh, cannot resolve symbol on editor info. Editor info? Yeah. Um, it might have auto imported it for me. Um, so I can go look up and see what that import is. Um, there it is. There's the import it brought in. Okay, I'm missing that one. All I Any questions so far? Uh, I got to type this out manually. It's not yeah. going to work. Maybe we take a break or something, or I don't know how much more we got. Well, I already posted Carp it in chat, so if you need to, oh, you can copy and okay. paste it from oh, chat. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. So um, if you're having trouble, then just grab it from there. Um, so what I want to do now that I've got that listener is I actually want to hook it up. So I'm creating a listener object and then I can connect that to the different views that we want that to um, trigger on. So um, I would say like name edit and, and I can say set on editor action listener. And so there I'm going to pass my edit listener and then I can do that for each of the fields. So name, address, name, address, phone. And, and so the benefit of doing something like this, um, it makes it very easy to hook up a list, you know, a listener to all your fields to do things like validation, for instance. You might want to run some standard validation anytime the user changes a field or such. And so once you get all that in, you should be able to say go into the field. I hit that, it pops up as next, next, next as I go down until I finally get to the, the last one and it should pop up a toast that says done. Okay. Any questions with that so far? So the only thing that that does is it mm -hmm. just creates that toast. That's it. it just right now, that's that's all I'm doing with it, right? But I could do a lot of things with that, and and I do want to do something with it here in a minute, potentially. But but the biggest thing that I can use that for is doing validation or various other things. I can really run any code I want there. Daniel, were you trying to say something? Me? Oh. Was that you? I heard somebody. 
No, not me. Okay. Um, yeah. So the the point is, I can really the 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 point is that lets this listener lets me hook up code to the next key or the done key. Um, part of the reason I wanted to bring it up too is we'd kind of ask the question of like, well, when do we need to hook up, you know, listeners in code? Well, this is this is where that happens. Everybody with me there? Yeah. Uh, w would so. it be possible as well to go mm -hmm. back? I would think a previous key would be very helpful for um, navigation. Yeah, you would think so. Um, as far as I know, there is no previous key on the on there. Um, so you, the only way to go back is either to drag and tap. There's not a there's not a back key on the soft keyboard. Um, you can do that if you have a physical keyboard and do um, shift tab. Or yeah, right. right. I think, but actually, that's not working for me. But um, no, there's if you have a D pad, for instance, then you can go up or down and things like that. But no, there's not a way to do previous um, with the soft keyboard as it's implemented. Now, it's worth noting that I'm just here using the default keyboard that's built into this version of Android. Um, a lot of different, you know, your manufacturer typically ships, often ships their own keyboard with your device. So if you have a Samsung device, for instance, by default, the Samsung keyboard's installed. Um, but you can actually find a few different keyboards on the App Store um, which function differently. So for instance, Hacker Keyboard is one that you can download and use with with any any device. There's a bunch of different keyboard apps where you can actually replace your keyboard that ships with the device with, with a different keyboard. So that's something that's configurable in Android. Okay, so we've kind of got, you know, you kind of can start to see how you can hook up some of these listeners, right? So we hooked up a listener for listening to the radio buttons. We hooked up listeners for um, the action key. Um, you know, looking at this, um, I think that those are the, the main ones I want. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go down to the on by function finally, and let's think about what we want to do in response to um, when you click on buy. Um, so when you click on buy, I probably want to pull out all the information that you've entered so far and maybe do something with it. So, so what would be maybe a good thing to do with the information on this form? What could, it, what could I do with that with what I do? What are my options? Uh, we could create an object of a order, an order object. I could do that. I could do that. Then what? And then create a constructor for that object of all these things. Okay. I'm thinking about like what can I do in terms of what the user sees. What do we want to do with this order? I would think an, another activity that would show the total. Okay. That could be one thing I could do. I don't have any prices, though. So one thing that maybe I could do um, is build up some sort of message that kind of is maybe a receipt of some sort. Um, and maybe that pass that along. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, you know, ways that we could deal with that, I could, um, I could create another screen, and we could go over to that other screen. Um, we could just simply show that in a toast message. Uh, we could pop up an alert dialog. Uh, we haven't really talked about alert dialogs yet, but we will shortly. Um, and, and they're really not that hard to use. Um, but maybe what I'll start with is just a toast. It's going to be a really, really tall toast, um, but that way I don't have to make an entire another screen just to do this process. Does that make sense? So 
keeping it easy, I'll just make a toast. So if I think about what kind of my, my long-term goal, um, I think if I'm going to show a toast, I just need to get it all into a long string. Um, so, so string builder is my friend. So I'm going to start by creating a string builder. And this is going to be maybe your receipt. New string builder. Let's create a string builder for your receipt. And then in the end, we're going to show that as a toast. Um, and I could easily change this code. Once I've gotten it in a string, I could easily change this to show it in a dialog, or I could change it to put it in another screen. Um, but putting it in a toast is enough to kind of proof of concept to see that things are working. Um, so build a receipt. Um, information I want to pull out, so probably First in the receipt, I want to append uh, maybe the, the name that you've entered. So I might do name edit dot get text. And in there, then I will say append a new line character slash in. And maybe I want to say get text. No, I just needed to say get text. Um, and so the receipt next may be the address. So let's add in their address, address edit dot get text, and append. Are we supposed to use Actually. double quotes? Um, double quotes are for strings, uh, single quotes are for characters. So I only have a single oh. character here, so I don't I don't need double quotes. So you can do that as long as you have just one character. And so there's there's a there's two there's a few different versions of append as you can see. So there I'm calling the character version instead of calling the string version. That's the difference. So append and then maybe we put the phone number in there. Uh, phone edit. Get text. Um, dot append. Uh, slash in and I want to get what else the email would be the next one dot append email edit dot get text and so let's append that here slash n and so I've got those fields, and finally would be the note. So append note edit get text, and let's append a slash in here. Put all those pieces together. Am I missing a field? Name, address, phone, email, and note. Okay. So the last thing I want to put in there is the delivery mode. OK, so so how can I figure out what the current delivery mode is? Well, maybe the easiest way to do it is to just see which one is checked. So if I just say I, I've got all three a reference to all three of these, so I can just say same day delivery mode. Um, if it is checked, um, then I can put into the receipt. Um, that text. So I might say in the receipt dot append the um, text that's on there. So same day delivery get text dot append slash n. And so I can do that for each of the three radio buttons. And so the last thing I need to do is just show my toast. So make text this. Um, receipt and toast dot length long dot show. 
So take all the text, kind of build up a string with all that info in it, and then finally show it. So if I click buy with nothing entered, I just get a big empty toast. If I say here, one, two, three, street, and maybe five, 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 one, two, three, four. Email John dot doe at example dot com. And this is my note. And let's say maybe next day delivery service. I can go ahead and hit there. And so I have a nice big, I have a nice big toast with all of that info. So you kind of notice one of the things the you know, kind of pay attention with the uh, check boxes or the radio buttons, oftentimes you don't need to necessarily respond to when the items clicks itself. Um, oftentimes you can just say at the time where you want to do whatever action, then go figure out which, which thing is checked. Any questions there? Nope. So the last thing to do before we call it a day um, is I want to put in a spinner. And so what the spinner is going to do, um, it's going to give us, we're going to put it next to the phone number and the email address. And what it's going to do is it's going to be selecting what kind of phone number is it, right? So is it like your personal phone number? Is it work? Is your work number, etc. Um, so I'm going to put that as a little drop down next to both the the phone number and the email address. Okay. Um, so to start that process out, I need to store that list. And I could just put that code, I could put that directly into my um, Java as, a, as an uh, array of strings. Um, but what we typically do is we put it into strings.xml um, because you want it to be able to be translated because it's text that the user is going to see. So remember, um, anything that the user is going to see, anything that needs to be translated needs to be here. Okay. Um, so you can see we've got all these strings already in strings XML. Um, I'm going to create a string array. Um, and maybe this is going to be um, phone uh, types. And so in there I might have a few different items. And so we think about, you know, personal. Maybe personal work and other. Okay. So that's how I'm going to specify um, in XML that I want an array of strings. So we would be able to basically copy this and do the same for email. Yeah, do the same for email. Um, I'm actually not going to make a separate one because I'm just going to use the same array for both phone and email. So you could create another one for both. I'm just going to use the same one. Okay. And, and so I might, maybe I should call this contact types then. Yeah, that might be a better name for it definitely a little bit more universal maybe a little bit more universal that way um, but that's that's all you've got to do in terms of defining a an array of strings in XML um, some some resources that you read up in tutorials will tell you to put um, these string arrays into a file called arrays.xml instead of strings.xml um, that is not what you want to do the reason is arrays.xml is typically not translated and then you have a problem where things like this don't get, they stay in be English only. Um, the reason you want to put this into 
um, strings.xml and on arrays XML is you want to make sure, well, it gets translated into whatever language you put your app in. Got it? So that's why I'm doing it here. Um, okay, so going back to the order activity now, or sorry, I need to go to the layout first. Um, so I want to put that next to the phone. Well, right now I've got that phone field, I've got it anchored all the way to the right. Um, so I'm going to actually pick both the phone and the email. Um, before I do anything else, I'm going to change their their widths to wrap content, so they're not taking up the full width. And then from there, I'm going to remove the constraints from the right sides of those two fields. Right, So they're just floating over on the left. Okay. Um, so now that I've done that, I can put the spinners in um, next to both of those fields. Um, and let's see, what section are the spinners in? Oh, there it is. So under containers, it's all the way up the top. So I'm going to bring in a spinner. Um, and now one of the interesting things about spinners is, unlike a lot of other controls that we've covered so far, um, they are not actually um, text views. Um, oh, that did not work the way I wanted it to be. Um, I want the width of this to be wrap content. There we go. Okay. So I need to set that to wrap content for the width and height. I need to anchor that to the top there. Okay. So the this spinner is going to have an anchor on the right and the top. Um, no anchor on the left um, because I'm going to end up making it be basically a fixed width. So maybe here let's set this width to 100 dp. Yeah, maybe a little bit wider than that. Maybe say 200 dp. Or no, yeah, I need to have this for mobile. So call it 100 dp. Okay, so 100 dp for the width, um, wrap content for the height. Um, Oh, and I need to do that other trick. So the constraints, um, rather than hooking this spinner to the um, control above it, I'm actually going to constrain the top to the top of the edit text that it goes with and the bottom to the bottom of the edit text. Um, what that does is it ends up centering the spinner with the edit text that it's going with. You probably want it a little bit over to the left as well, the spinner. Seems um, awkward there over the right. So it is. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to anchor the edit text to it and get the edit text back to match constraint. So the the edit text is going to be as wide as it can be, and the spinner is going to be fixed at 100 dp. That's how I'm going to solve that problem. Because the options are basically a, a fixed width, because we know what they are. Um, they don't really change, versus the, the phone number could be larger. Same thing with the email address. So I've got one spinner there that's next to the phone, and I'm going to put another spinner over next to the email address. So one of the interesting things with spinners, uh, they're not text views, which means that you can't actually anchor them to baseline. Um, like edit text and text views and buttons are all text are all based on text view, um, so they can all be anchored to baseline. A spinner cannot, um, so that ends up being usually a little bit harder to align it. 
um, because I can't necessarily use, sometimes you have to use some additional tricks because you can't align the baseline. Um, so that's where I'm aligning it, the top to the, the, edit, the top of the edit text, the bottom to the bottom of the edit text to center it there. Um, so that's the way I'm dealing with the problem that is not a text view. Um, entries, um, things you can do in here. Um, you can either set up the entries in code, and that's usually what you end up doing. Um, there is an option now, though, um, in here. If you go to the spinner and select entries, um, I can actually select content types from there and connect it to the array that I created um, using that entries property. And so if I go back, once I've set that entries property, I kind of go back here, I can, can see a preview of, of what that looks like. Um, now, I know that kind of looking at the preview, maybe I do need to go back to make these wider. Yeah, so maybe make those 150 dp. And we can try that on the device. And so it should pop up like a drop down there for you. Any questions on the, the way that I've got those constraints hooked up? Has everybody got that figured out and sorted out? Yeah, on my end at least. Now, let me try this real quick on the Nexus, on the API 21 device. Let's see if it works there as well. Yeah, works the same way. Now, one of the things you'll see there on the API 21 that works differently than it does on API 30, or probably your physical device as well, um, when I go into the order screen, you'll notice that it immediately puts focus on the first element. Everybody see that? Yeah, it should do that, right? Um, sometimes that's what you want, sometimes. Um, I would say on this screen, it's not necessarily a help. It might be helpful, it might not. Um, so what I do want to show you is how to get them to behave the same way. Um, because you definitely don't want it to be different between, say, API 21 and API 30. Um, so the way to change what it picks first as the focus is actually you go into the manifest, um, and there's a property that you can change. Um, it's called Window Soft Input Mode. And... Uh, Windows soft input mode. And I want to say state hidden is the one I want. So what that should do is now on any API, including API 21, including API 30, that it should come in here with nothing popped up yet you mean the keyboard doesn't pop up the keyboard doesn't pop up initially so that's the that is the attribute that you use to change what is whether or not the keyboard's there initially make sense yeah um, yeah i would think you'd want that by default I would say usually I would say that's it, that's really a, a depend that's a dependent thing. Sometimes you want it to show up immediately. Sometimes you don't. Um, if I was, for instance, think about it this way. Oftentimes I have a screen to add an item and I have a screen to edit an item. Um, in the screen to add an item, it could kind of go either way. But if I'm going to edit something, I don't. I definitely don't want it to pre-select the first thing. I definitely don't want the, the the keyboard to show up initially. Um, 
I'd say just in general, it's probably better that the keyboard doesn't show up initially. So it doesn't prevent the keyboard from popping up. It just prevents it from going to the first thing to focus, which would prompt the keyboard. Right? It, no, it's still, it's still, the first thing's still focused. You can see here it in blue. Mm. The only thing it does is it keeps the keyboard from showing up when you go to the screen. Okay. All right. So it means that the screen, the screen is initially, that is initially hidden. Um, the other thing that you can kind of play around with there, oh, let me close this and go to, go back to API 30. Um, the other thing that you can do in there is adjust how kind of the keyboard shows up in the sense of um, does the view get resized and things like that. So in here, um, I believe, so it's, it's nice and it's doing the right thing now um, where you kind of see the, the keyboard effectively pushes the, the bottom of the screen up. Um, that has been a, a problem historically with different cases where oftentimes the keyboard will cover the bottom part of the screen. Uh, so sometimes you may run into that. And at that point you can put into here, um, I think that was the adjust resize. So I can, I think I can put both of those in there. State hidden bar adjust resize. Can I put both of those in there or is it complaining? Rearrange check outwards. Okay. Um, so say it's initially hidden and for sure it should be adjusting the screen. Um, so oftentimes that's oftentimes I have to come in for screens like this that have a lot of fields and set both of those two things. Um, state hidden and adjust resource to, to satisfy all the different versions of Android. Would it be considered poor UX to hide the UI? Is it in the notification bar? Because that takes up a lot of space. You could put a lot um, more on there. This thing? You're talking about the, uh, the status yeah, bar? You lose the arrow, but yeah, put the clock and where the apps are. Because you're just filling out a form for a second. If you really need to go back to what you need to do, you could just do that by going to your home screen maybe. So you know the answer I mean? is yes. You can hide that. Um, you can hide the... It is possible to to hide this area on top, the what we call the status bar with the clock and all of that. That is possible. Um, things to keep in mind. Um, oftentimes, um, a lot of modern phones have this thing called a notch at the top where the camera kind of cuts in. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you regain that space, you now have the notch in part of your app. Um, if you leave this as is, the notch is going to be up here and you won't have to do anything about it. But if you want to go to full screen, then you have to deal with the notch. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is while you can remove that, um, that, is the, that is only meant to be done when you're going into full screen. So if you're, if you're showing a video, um, then it's perfectly fine to remove all this stuff. If you if the user's watching a video or playing a game, things like that, oftentimes we do hide those two pieces. Um, generally speaking, though, in business apps, that's usually frowned upon is to hide those two things. Um, so I would say probably just leave it alone. Okay, I don't know how to do it anyway, but I would think it would be right there yeah. where we're... I believe it's a different property. Um, it's not the Windowsoft input mode. It's a different property. Um, but again, as I would say, for, for business apps, um, I don't think you usually want to do it. And I forget what the... It's a flag that you have to set. Um, but I forget what what it is specifically that, that I have to set there to do it. I know I've done it before. Well, okay, but, we don't need to worry about that yeah. though. I think real. last I think last time I did it, I did in code. So, um, yeah, I would just leave it. Cool. Okay, so we've seen, um, you know, we've seen some of the stuff in terms of you know how to work with keyboards, how to kind of make that behave the way you need it to. Um, we saw a little bit with spinners. Oh, that's what I didn't finish. Um, I wanted to 
finish looking at that. So I put the I put the drop down in, but I didn't actually pull the value out in terms of what the user selected. So I still need to do that. Um, going to order activity, um, I want to add that into the receipt. So I need a reference to both of those spinners, which I don't have yet. So private, oh, and I didn't give them IDs either. I need to go back here. Um, so we'll call that um, maybe phones, maybe phone spinner and email spinner. Keep it simple. Phone spinner, email spinner. So references to them, private, spinner, um, phone spinner, private, spinner, email spinner, So those are there, and now I just need to use those in my onBuy method. So under onBuy, um, I want to, when we output the phone, I want to say what kind of phone number it is. So append, maybe put a separator in between. And maybe I'll just do a pipe, pipe dot append. And here I want to say phone spinner. Now, when I'm working with the phone spinner, um, remember I said that the the spinners are not text views, um, which means that you can't use like get text to get the selected item. Is everybody with me there? So I can't use get text to get the selected item. Okay, So I'm going to use a different method. Um, and so in the list, let's see where is the method that I'm looking for, get. Um, is it get current? Item at position. Oh, get selected item. Yeah, that's what I want. Get selected item. And so get selected item returns the thing that I have selected. And remember that we populated the drop down with a string array, right? So the selected item is a string. Um, so that's that's what I need there is to say um, grab that. And so for email, I'll do the same thing. I'll append a pipe. And then I'm going to add in the selected item slash n. So rather than using get text with the spinner, you get, you say get selected item. So let's say here, I'm going to put in my info. John Doe, one, two, three, phone, five, 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 one, two, three, four. Maybe make that work. And the next one is, um, 
John dot doe at example dot com other test. And so you can kind of see the the thing pipe pop up there in the pop up, right? Where I've got the work and other. The next doesn't go to the radio buttons, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't. So you'll notice there, um, when I get to the last one, right, it doesn't go. It goes to done. Um, so the reason that it doesn't do that is because the radio buttons are not focusable. Um, in fact, you'll also notice the same thing happens if I try to go from the phone to the email. It skips these two spinners because they're not focusable. So if I want them to be, if I want them to be in that um, cycle, I need to actually make them focusable. Um, so if I were to go back to here, um, I can mark that if I remember right. Actually, just go do it through the code. Um, so I could say here, focusable, and maybe make this true. And we, can, we should be able to see a different... I think I might have to set this as focusable in touch mode as well. Um, but I think we can see something there. Nope, not yet. So I think I need focusable in touch mode. It says auto in the, if you yep. try to set it in the view, the design. Okay. Not true. Aha. So I'm going to set both of those that is focusable and focusable in touch mode to make sure that they can get down there. There we go. So that's what I ended up having to do. Um, although then we notice that um, as soon as I get down there, then it becomes an enter key, which ends up activating it. So, you know, there's kind of a, you can bring some of those things into the mix um, as far as being um, in the in the focus order, but oftentimes those things are not meant to be, right? So I could manipulate it that way. Seems like it's not working very well. Um, so what I might do instead um, is in here, um, so pull the focusable tags out because effectively if those are things at the end well the user is going to have to go away out of here and then pick that have to dismiss that um, Now, one of the things you'll notice anytime you hit the buy button, so everybody see how the keyboard stays up? Yeah. Um, so a lot of times when you have your user submitting forms like that, um, you know, basically when they hit the submit button or the buy button there, um, oftentimes we want to make the keyboard go away. Um, so there's there's a little bit of code that you have to write um, in order to make that happen. Um, so for instance here, um, what I want to do, that would be an on by, um, is where I need to hook it up. But I'm actually going to write a completely separate method. Now, I think that I linked an article on your, um, because they, they don't talk about how to do it in the chapter, um, I linked an article into your, your lab, so under 4.2. Um, handle input method visibility um, and that talks about some of the things that we've already kind of covered um, as well as some other things um, 
they provide a method here. You see this? Everybody see show soft key, soft keyboard? Yeah. Um, so this is what you would need to do if you wanted to show it, um, which suffice to say is more code than it really should have been. Um, to show it or hide it? You want to hide it, show right? it. I want to hide it. Um, so, so this is kind of what they give you for needing to show it. Um, so that's from that we can kind of we we can we can pull out the bits of logic that we need. So in order to work with the um, in order to work with the soft keyboard, um, you have to actually use this thing called the input method manager, right? Um, so my goal is to hide the keyboard. So public void hide keyboard. And so in order to, to do that, I need to first get this input method manager, um, which involves calling this function called get system service. So that gets kind of a, a piece of the operating system. Um, you use from context, there's a bunch of constants for the different services that are available. Um, you know, networking services, Bluetooth services, etc. Here I'm, I'm working with the IME specifically. Um, so the input method manager, um, and then from the input method manager, I believe, just kind of like they showed so show, show soft, I believe there's a method called hide, hide soft input. Uh, from window, um, and if, which of these two do I need? So it needs to take in a window token. Okay, so I need to tell it focus, get current focus, dot get window token. And what were the flags? What flag do I want? I think I don't. I let's just say I don't set any flags. So I'm going to set the flags here as zero and try to use this method. Hi keyboard. That again the. You, you dived into that as um, I hold control and I clicked on the method. Let's just see if that works. I think I've got that right. So click here. Yep, that works. Um, so there's kind of the the magic sauce to make the keyboard go away, um, which oftentimes you need for usability purposes. Where did you call it? Um, I called it from on Oh, by. there it is, there it is, okay. Yeah. So oftentimes I'll extract that as a separate method like this, so I can just use it and then forget about the logic of how it actually works. Are we pushing the code soon for yes. the attendance? Yes, please push the code for attendance. Because that's all we got. Are we completed with this test then? We are completed with this, yes. Yeah. So you kind of got some intro, a little bit to work with spinners, different UI controls. Um, you got some different things about how to work with the soft, in, the, the soft keyboard. So, yeah. Okay. With what we got so far, working with the labs, I, I haven't dived into four point two, but uh, yeah. how far can we build those out with what we know right now? Is it? I think that we've, you know, if you look at what I've said, so here's the here's the part for four point two that I've asked you to add to the project that you're working on, right? So add an edit text to checkbox, radio button, switch, spinner, and so we've talked about how to use those, you know, radio buttons and checkboxes is basically the same thing. You just don't need a radio group um, for your checkboxes switches. You just use is checked, if I remember right, to, to 
see if it's on or off. So we've we've talked about how to use those. We've used it. We put a spinner in there. Um, you know, I talked about to do input types, IME options. That's that's the flag that you use to change. Is it next or done or or search or things like that? That's to change the action button. Um, I showed you how to set up the on interaction listener. We looked at the window soft input mode. That was the thing in the activity. Um, and then I just showed you how to use the, the input method manager piece to hide the keyboard. So we, I think we've talked about everything on that sheet. Okay. Yeah. So trying to think how, uh, what all we got to do. This is due. I got to look Friday, right? Mm -hmm. Friday. And then we got a uh, homework, the clicking test. I think I saw that. And then some reading. Um, let me look at the schedule. So you've got your, your worksheet because we'll have another lab day tomorrow. So that the worksheet that you started on yesterday is the same thing to continue with tomorrow. Um, the reading on perusal. And then um, there's some homework questions, um, but the homework questions are not due until the, the 23rd. So you can start that quiz, but you don't need to turn it in yet. So the big things for, you know, the rest of today and tomorrow, it'd be to just finish up the, the reading and the, um, and the worksheet. All right. All right. Awesome. Get to it then. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. And see you tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions on the material today before we dismiss? Before you go off? Just mm -hmm. Not yet. I'll probably have to experiment a little bit tomorrow to okay. see if I have any questions. Okay. Right. Yeah, I, I do have a question, not about this, though. Yep. It's just about Android Studio. Is that probably what I need to do, is just uninstall and reinstall? So you can try. Problem? You can try. I don't know if I don't know if it'll fix your problem or not. Uh, if it doesn't, what do I do? I mean, is, is um, it, it... I don't know. You may need, if you have any plugins or themes installed, that might be the culprit. Themes for Android Studio, right? Yeah. If you have a custom theme that you've maybe installed, that could be part of it. I don't know. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm using the dark, but that's one of the standard okay. options. Yeah, I don't know that you might just. Yeah, I would just I would just try it and see if it fix it is is the basically the answer. And if it doesn't fix it, well, then I'm not sure. Oh, man. All right. Uh, <laughs> today, <laughs> this thing was beating me up today. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I gotta redo the whole setup and everything. Then I would say all my settings would be lost, or would I try um, to? I don't know if I think when you when you reinstall, I think as long as you tell it not to delete it, and then you tell it to import it when you reinstall it, you should be able to keep those settings. However, your settings might also be the problem. Yeah. Okay. So you can keep your settings. But it, that might still lead to you still having the problems that you're having. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to read up on it. So I, I don't know exactly what's causing your problems, so I can't really speak to that. Okay. All right. Sure. I'll mess around with it and see. Too bad it's on the desktop. Otherwise, I could just fix it in yeah. class. Yeah. All right. Uh, see you tomorrow. Okay. See you All tomorrow. Right. Bye.